to. Can you hear oh. me now? Oh my gosh. There's your voice. I can hear okay. you now. Yep, I found it. You have an amazing mic. Yes, it's, uh, well, given what I do, I had to justify, you know, the right equipment for it. Yeah, no, everybody's like, voice. Yes. I told you guys. And see, look, there he is. And so I'll make your face smaller, so so don't worry. It's not going to be that awkward. I promise. <laughs> There's JMG. <clears throat> Yay! There he is, guys. And I have to always adjust this. With Fraser, with everybody else, I always have to adjust this. Story of my life, by the way. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. How's, how's life been since being back from the desert and not dying of heat? Boring. Um, <laughs> I know. Boring and pretty hot here, so, you know, boring and more humidity. <laughs> yeah, same, same. You guys hear his voice? His voice. His voice is smooth sounds of JMG. That's right. I'm going to start coming here for my daily dose of topamine and existential crisis. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the compliment on the hat. And I'm also, incidentally, wearing a Pickle Rick t-shirt. So I'm all set. <laughs> He's good to go, guys. Uh, his cam and voice are way off. No, they're not. Wait, say we talk again. A test. I mean, it's a little bit desynced, but... It's okay. This guy is the man. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. Like you, I mean, I could literally just play him without the cam, and you guys would be fine. Do you want it? Not too bad. It's not too bad. Are you drinking a margarita? No, actually, I'm drinking Fufu Italian sparkling water. Oh. But I have a bottle of wine sitting next to me, so as this, as this runs out, <laughs> I will be moving over to the red wine. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I haven't filled up whiskey just yet, but I'm getting close. I'm yeah. getting close. What kind of red wine, though? This one is a Pinot Noir. Oh. Uh, that's just a cheap Robert Mondavi Pinot Noir. Mm. So he knows. But it does the trick. Yeah, he knows his, uh, do you want a glass of whiskey? So I have whiskey downstairs, but, you know, we're, we, we're, we're, we're pacing ourselves right now. He hasn't, this is the first time that he's actually been on here, guys, since, uh, since our trip. And I told him, I need to get you on my stream because there's a lot of people on here that want to ask you questions about all the stuff he talks about. He's got a huge YouTube channel. Um, so not huge in terms of gamer huge, but yeah, see, there's all the stuff right there. He's got an amazing channel, the Event Horizon Show, which he interviews people. I'm sure I'll be on there. At some. I mean, I was kind of on there as a moderator, though. Sort of. No, we'll bring you on on your own too. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's a thing, you know. And and but but I really wanted him to come on here too every now and again so that you guys can can ask questions about some of the stuff that he talks about on his channel. So he has not only the Event Horizon show, but he has his own YouTube, and that has a lot of those top ten lists that we watch all the time. We watched one about Venus. I don't know if you guys remember. Um, yeah, Pinot Noir. Yeah, he was he was just talking about that. <laughs> You might need to actually have that faster than, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's after five where you are. It's totally acceptable. Oh yeah. Anytime after 3 PM, I'm ready. <laughs> um, but I'm waiting for other people to have questions. Like who's familiar with JMG here in my chat? Cause you guys are like really slow at talking right now. Suddenly there's like, there's nobody saying anything, which is fine. Him and I can just talk. We, we did it. We had a, we had a almost a three and a half hour ride, which we slept for a good portion of it, but this guy. Margaritas are good for 12 p.m. onward. True. I haven't been here in a while. So I'll bring up his channel in the background so you guys can actually see his lovely face and everything that he does. Because um, it is, it is. again, these are these are one of the many people that going on this uh, journey that was, it was just amazing. So here's the Event Horizon channel. Um, I'll take away my face and I can take away his as well. I can actually do both. It's pretty cool. Look at that, guys. Look at that. Look at look at this pro streamer right here. But this is uh, this is his Event Horizon channel. We haven't watched this. How was this interview? The that one? Yeah. Oh, that went really well. Um, it's actually probably one of the better interviews I've done in the last few months because uh, the star is just unbelievably weird, and um, the scientist that was the actual guy that discovered it. So. Um, so it went very well. I definitely recommend that interview. Yeah. So, so 
catch me up on this real quick and, and everybody else too. Why is that star? So HD 139139 really weird. Okay. What's going on with a star mm -hmm. is in the Kepler two data, you know, the sort of revived Kepler mission after the, uh, some of the equipment failed, they repurposed it. It picked up a star HD 139139 that appeared to have transiting planets passing by, mm -hmm. you know, blocking light from the star transiting. And several weird features were found with the, with this, this apparent planetary system. The first is that all of the planets appeared to be the same size, except for one. And they saw 28 transits and all of them were the same size, except for one. So that's weird because they're, you had, they think actually, depending on the geometry of this, it could be they're, they're about 1.5 times the size of earth. Huh. The next problem that was found was that no periodicity was found in the dips, meaning that these planets uh, were not orbiting close into the star. Right. But there was in, there was some indicator that they were close. They're just not apparently in any kind of an orbit we understand. So that looks very strange because, you know, planets orbit and they transit and right. they repeat. And that's, you know, what you look for in, in data like, like curves from Kepler. Right. And this one, they're not repeating. So they have no idea what this is. So the, the big theory right now is that it may be a new type of sunspot mm -hmm. causing it. And that these are very, very short lived sunspots. But the thing is, the star is very much like the sun. It's a little bit more luminous, a little bit bigger, but it's only about 1.5 million years old. So is it possible that that sunspots evolve over time and that maybe this We've just never seen this type of short-lived sunspot. That's the best explanation, but it's not a very good one because these really look like transiting planets. They, they in the light curve, they look like a planet exactly, and sunspots, eh, not so much. Um, so there's that. Then there's, um, oh hey Ross, uh, there's also um, another question is why would they all be the same size? You know, that's, that's another weird thing because, you know, planetary systems tend to have be all over the place, but at the same time at 1.5 times the size of earth, that makes it a super earth, which is probably the most, one of the most common types of planets out there. We see them everywhere. So, so that may not be that surprising. Um, but that's, that's basically it is that the star is just doing something inexplicable and it's probably an astrophysical explanation for it. But there's also a SETI, ex, you know, possibility there. Maybe, you know, at the very bottom of the barrel, if you can't figure it out, maybe it might be something that an alien civilization is doing. Um, so that's that's present with this star. Mm -hmm. um, there was a paper written in the early 2000s by an astronomer named Luke Arnold, and he hypothesized that, well, a giant radio beacon is really expensive to run. You right. know, if you're if you're saying, hello, universe, we're here and you do it with a giant omnidirectional radio beacon, you need a lot of energy for that. So wouldn't it make more sense if aliens were more efficient than that and that they simply put up a baffle, you know, a louver or a giant triangle or something enormous or if it appears enormous, it could just be a mylar sheet that does not occur in nature. You know, a big square passes in front of a star right. and that would be a much, much more long term manageable and cheaper way to announce your presence to the galaxy. And okay, this in this case, why not make a star system that looks really unnatural and uh, basically tells astronomers throughout the galaxy that this doesn't happen in nature. So we're telling you that we're here just simply by showing you something that's impossible in nature, which might be something like this system, but we're not anywhere close to that yet. Right. Um, I right. think that there's very likely what we have here is a very complicated system involving two stars and the planets are moving in some strange way. But as of right now, that's not a very, not a very good explanation. And that's, that's kind of the problem is there's no really good explanations for this one. And it's, right. and it's, it's also weird. Oops, hold on. It's also oh. weird that we wouldn't see this happening elsewhere. You know, this is one out of 300,000 stars in, um, the Kepler's field of view for the second right. mission that's doing this. It's the only one. So what's up with that? You know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, sunspots, so the sunspot potential explanation, those only last like a week, maybe sometimes several weeks. I mean, in this right? case, 
in this case, they would have to be lasting for hours. Right. They appear and disappear within hours, and we've never seen that with. That's um, weird. Yeah. That's really bizarre. What star is this? This is HD one three nine one three nine. He actually had it right here. I'll put it, put it in the background. It might start, might start talking. Last week it was announced. I mean, see, same voice, guys. Same, same voice, right? Um, the link to this one, and we're gonna watch it uh, later tonight too, after we have the actual person on here. <laughs> Um, so it, it's a weird star. Um, again, we're talking about like how, how those transits are working. There's something kind of, uh, odd about the transit. Um, and, and again, that sunspot explanation again, sunspots that from what we know, they only last, you know, a week, sometimes several weeks. So that's really weird that that would be something that would happen. Um, but so what about dust? So is dust, <clears throat> dust is, is on the table. Uh, maybe dusty asteroids, or, you know, asteroids bouncing into each other, creating dust. The thing is, is that the light curve with dust, light curves tend to be all over the place. You, you know, you see like huge dips and, and things like that, and then small dips and a whole, you know, grouping of, of uh, sizes. With this, they're all the same size and dust doesn't really fit that very well. The other thing is that they really do look like planets in the light curve. They really look like a transiting planet. So dust is on the table, but it has a lot of problems in this case. Um, but the way to figure that out, I guess, is just to, you know, study further and, you know, look at the wavelengths of light and see if there's something, you know. Um, another possibility that's been mentioned is a disintegrating planet. Mm -hmm. That, uh, But again, you, you should see things differently than you do. I suspect maybe this might be a case of no one's thought of what it is yet. If it's a natural, you know, occurrence, no one's thought of what it is yet. And that in the coming months, somebody will, you know, release a paper and nail it. Right. And that happened with, uh, I forget the name of the star, but it happened with a star with a, had a planet with a really, really wild ring system a number of years ago. And they were like, well, we don't know what this is, but then somebody figured it out. And, um, it was just this ridiculously extensive ring system that was that was causing the light curve dips that were appearing strangely. So my suspicion that's going to be something like that. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, with Tabby Star, we we thought it was you know really ominous and crazy, but then you know dust. <laughs> yeah, Tabby Star, the weird one there, and and to my knowledge, this is still not solved. Is not completely dust. What, yeah, dust tends to. Um, it, 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 if it's if it's present, it tends to absorb, you know, and radiate infrared. Right. You know, from it, it, the dust gets warm from the star. So they looked at Tabby's star for infrared, and they didn't see any. So mm -hmm. that's what the chink in the armor of dust there was. So the, it led to questions about, well, could this be dust in the interstellar medium? Nope. So whatever it is, it has to be cold dust in orbit around the star. And it's very tiny dust. It's more like cigarette smoke than dust, really. And the question is, what causes that? <clears throat> that said, that particular story, to me, I covered it pretty extensively. And I thought about the possibilities. But to me, it always really seemed like it was going to be a dust type of thing. Because if they'd have seen infrared with it, then it just simply said dust. Mm -hmm. And that would have been the end of it. It wouldn't have even, you know, been newsworthy. It's that it didn't have it. And there were some weird features in the light curve of Tabby Star as well. Yeah, there was. There definitely was. So, yeah. But um, my my go on. My con my concern there though is that you know why haven't we seen other Tabby stars? And I think we're starting now to see similar stars finally. But for the longest time, it was the only one that was doing this. So yeah, that was weird. what was really weird. Yeah, I think I think as we go on further with Tess, you know, um, which yeah. is taking over. From Kepler, if you guys don't know, it's yep. the Transiting Exosur Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Wow. Um, I feel like I've been talking about astronomy for three hours and 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so that that one, is as we see more of these exoplanets show up, we're going to see a lot of shit. This is going to happen. This is going to be something. Right? Yeah, a lot Tess of is, weird Tess anonymous. Is gonna be, Tess is going to be a, a, a manufacturer of mysteries, um, and it already is, really, because it's it's the data from, the first data from it is up on planet hunters and they have their own citizen science thing going and you can go in and look at the uh, light curves and try to pick out um, dips as planets transit but um and so chat's, and it's, it's, chat's and weird loving stuff all is this already though. showing up so. 
you got to see what chat's saying here. So f a few things. So people are saying, what star is this? We just said that. How far away is it? So 350 light years. Ross, Ross is handling a lot of these. Um, <laughs> Ross, we can tell you've done this. <laughs> and um, this in Nibiru is the same thing. No, Nibiru is the planet X, guys. Right? John, tell me. Nibiru's Nibiru was, yeah, Nibiru was, uh, that was Zechariah Sitchin making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> completely honest. You can say shit, by the way. You're, you're on Twitch. You're fine. Yeah. I, I, I will use this. Th I will put this on YouTube, but I'm not going to monetize. Like, I, I don't, I don't make money on my YouTube, you know, yet. So. Yeah. Is it, once I get into the wine, I'll, uh, I'll start cussing like a sailor. I'm going to say you got to start getting into the wine. This is the only way we have to do this because I will actually go and make a whiskey drink too. Even though my, I start to like towards the end, my brain starts, you know, being a thing. It just goes away. You already know this. You've seen me do this now for a few days. Yes, and I, <laughs> my brain goes away after about a half hour. Yeah. And I could never do this. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So it's fun to – that's why I have, you know, Pamela on here. I wish Fraser actually did drink because that would be hilarious. Um, but Pamela will actually sit here and, and, and drink with us. And then she ends up, you know, talking about programmers if this were a simulated universe and that they could go fuck themselves because this is a <laughs> shitty universe. You know what I mean? <laughs> um uh, sunspots and turns very slowly. So, yeah, so our star actually rotates, you know, uh, so most stars actually rotate different speeds. So at the equator, you're going to get a faster rotation. I think it's like 27 days at the or 25 days, actually, at the equator, 29 at the pole. So you get an average about 27 days for a sun to rotate once. Um, So so this being a younger star, does it have a faster rotation? Do they? You know I'm not sure if that's been established yet. Um, all, all we really know is that it's a G-type uh, sun. Okay, so very it's similar a to the sun, mm -hmm. and it's um, it's uh, younger. It's one and a half billion years, and it's um, it's a little bit more luminous, and it's a little bit bigger than the sun, but it's very similar temperature. So mm -hmm. it's it's really very sun-like, and that's that's another weird one. I mean, you could run away with yourself thinking about this kind of stuff, but we also happen to be transiting the sun from the perspective of that star. So if you had a Kepler spacecraft at HD 139, 139 pointed at the sun, you would see Earth and <laughs> Jupiter and everything transiting. How do you think we'd which... make sense of the asteroid belt? Do you think that that would cause any kind of transit disturbance? I don't know that the asteroid belt has enough material in it to yeah. do it. Um, but what they would probably notice... Let's see. What would they notice? Um, Not Pluto. For sure, they would never notice Pluto. Who would? Yeah, they'd see <laughs> Jupiter. They'd see Saturn. They'd see Uranus and Neptune. They may not see the inner planets, but if they have a, you know, if they got a telescope the size of Chicago, they're going to see it, you know, so it just depends on what equipment they have. <laughs> so now my chat's doing poor Plutos because I, make, I, always, I always make jokes on Pluto and Mars, but it's okay. Oh, so, so so there's good questions coming in. So, um, and and again, like if you if you're like I have no idea, I usually say I have no idea. How about direction? Oh, wait, wait. Wenaji also says he loves your stuff too. Um, uh, Saucy Ross is actually a part of the production team, Wenaji. So, um, yes, Ross is the producer. Yeah. Um. I'm not sure I understand what we're talking about. So we're talking about a star and, and, and it's abnormal. So when, so how we detect planets, okay, exoplanets, is by their transit. That Mostly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other ways you can detect. There's ways we call um, uh, the radio stars. Radio velocity. Radio velocity. The stars wobble. Yeah. So the stars being manipulated, right, by the planets. And then... And then you can also do things like micro lensing, which is not too common. You could do direct imaging, which is also not that common at all. But the most common is a transit. And, and the way I usually see – ready for this, John? You're so ready for this. I told you this is how I demonstrate to my, my chat what transit is. So here's transit. So you have a star, which is my cell phone right here. This is, this is what we call really, really bad astronomy. But then it goes in front. <laughs> But that's that's what we see. So when we see something like that happen, and of course, if I had you know my chapstick further away from that, you would see not that whole entire area be taken up. So the smaller the planet is, um, 
you know, even if it is closer in, if it's a bigger star, all these things are going to matter. So the stars that we see, are, you know, can be like our star, G-type star, or these small M dwarf stars, which are hard to see. But any kind of planet that's pretty big in size, you'll be able to see that transit more in depth. You will see a huge dip in the light coming out from that star, depending on the planet size. And that's how... I mean, you know about this. That's how we come up with these hot Jupiters left and right. We're finding them everywhere because they're big, right? Big, big, big planets. So, um, but, you know, if you had something like Pluto and no, <laughs> I'm going to try to Pluto shame. But if, if you had something like Pluto, who's, you know, 40 AU away from our host star and our star is not that big, it's going to be hard to see that kind of transit if you were trying to look at our solar system, right? Right, John? Like, compared to Jupiter, right? Yeah. The smaller the planet, the harder it is to see. Um, and we're limited when we start looking for, like, terrestrial planets and, you know, smaller than that. Yeah. We're really limited to very close stars because the further away it is, the harder it is to catch those. Now, of course, with James Webb, if it ever gets there... Um, <laughs> If it, it's going to open up a lot of doors there as far as studying directly the these exoplanets and try to characterize our atmosphere, maybe, and do things like that and directly image them and all that sort of stuff. That'll go a long way in, in uh, increasing our capability. But yeah, you really with, with, with these with these tiny planets like Mars, say, mm -hmm. we, we we don't have a it's it's very hard to spot something like that. Um, but. I mean, radial velocity does let you do that a little bit, you know, yeah. more than, you know, um, than the other methods do. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to send you something real quick that no one else can really see. Um, uh, is there any chat comments? You can read chat and respond to it. I mean, it's live. This is, this is the beauty of this, John. This is none of this is formal. None of it. This no is, formality. No formality. This is where you actually get to talk about space and not have to worry about me being like, oh, by the way, I'm going to edit that, John. <laughs> 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 by the way, I'm going to clip that part up. Like, no, this is completely, this is what I love about bringing people into astronomy that love astronomy, that talk about it. I want them to feel very comfortable. So, um, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, if, is there anything going on in the chat? I would be back in a moment. I'm going to go get my wine glass. Oh, man. I was just about to send you this message. And bust into the... Yeah, go get your wine glass. Definitely do that. <laughs> yes. I will be back in a moment. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and kill your cam so you can get up and walk away and not have to worry about people. Oh, wine. Good idea. That's what I'm saying. Um, this is campfire talk. Yeah. So so he's amazing, guys. We, we watch a lot of his stuff on here um, quite frequently, actually. Uh, and hydrostatic uh, equilibrium. That's what that is. But yeah, so the transit method, and I can show you while he's away, while my cam is super big, and I'm just pulling in views left and right. You guys have no idea. You have no idea. Like, they're just like, you know, transit method. Let's let's go. This is really awkward to have my cam this big. But this is what we do with, uh, uh, I'll show you what the transit method is like, okay? So here is the transit method, okay? So this is it. And you and can I'm see, back. and you're back. So I'm showing them I'm the back. transit method right here. So here is mm -hmm. what the transit method looks. This is this is it, guys. So this is a nice little demonstration of what that would be like. So you see how that would block the light there? Do you guys see that? So you have these dips, these curves in the light. Um, and that's, this is the most, so, so multiple planets, I can show you what a multiple planet system would look like, which is not common to think that there's usually just one planet circling a star. Eh, it can happen, but it's not very common, but you can see like different stars, different sizes, different masses. Um, and James Webb, again, just like John said, if it ever does launch, which would be, which would be great. I mean, that'd be amazing. Um, I have waited for many years. I know. I'll sell my soul. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it can run spectroscopy on these things. We can look at these things further and be like, oh, there's oxygen. Oh, cool. There's this, this, and that. Um, but I'm going to let you take over so I can get my drink. 
real okay. quick. And you, you did get that last message I sent? Yes. Okay. Yes. Roger that. Okay. So you're left with the chat. So you can literally just interact with chat. That's that's what you're going to do. You're just going to sit here and you're going to be like reading their questions. and. Yes. You now, know. ask me science questions, chatters. <laughs> ask science questions. Now, it's to get back to that planet real quick. Is is it just it's or the star HD one three nine one three nine? It's what's really weird about it is that it's just the only one, and that's that's what I can't get past is because it's you just don't see, you know, in astronomy you see lots of examples of stuff, you know, and in this case you just really don't. Um, unfortunately, there's also limits on what we can actually observe with the star. So this mystery may be going for years because, the, you know, it's very difficult to tell when you have two stars that close because it's a binary star system. It's really, really difficult to actually weed out what is um, going on around one star or the other star. And so this, this does present a lot of observational challenges. So this may be an open mystery for quite some time. Ask anything space related. Okay, A. Settler, when will we have something better than Kepler? We already do. It's called TESS. And um, it does basically the same thing as Kepler, only Kepler looked at just a very, very tiny portion of the sky. And it stared at that same portion of the sky for years. And um, so all we really know is what, what was going on within the field of view of Kepler. TESS is different because TESS takes all sky pictures and it um are almost all sky pictures and it just moves to you know bit by bit it takes a picture of the entire sky and um we can look for and i think the cadence on that is like every two minutes it takes a picture and we can look at the same spot of sky um for light curves over a period of months and but in this case we can do it with the almost the entire sky unfortunately the star, the this star, HD 139139, happens to lie on the ecliptic plane. So Tess, as of right now, can't look at it because the moon keeps passing by and, you know, would flood the detector and the Earth would do the same thing. So so there's really no way to, to use Tess to study this star right now. Maybe in coming years with orbital changes or something like that with that, with it, it might be more possible. Um, Chances of James Webb Space Telescope being actually launched in the next decade. I think I can finally say very good chance that it will launch. Probably 80% chance. That said, it's just taken so long with so many delays. You know, you just, you can't really, you never know. But it's got to be getting close by now. That's my sense of it. Um, I know Mars is a popular candidate for talks of colonization, but how are future colonists going to deal with the lack of a magnetosphere? <coughs> Good question. Um, well, you can deal with it just by staying inside your habitat, um, or, you know, converted lava tube or whatever. But it, I think it's going to be, a, you know, the idea of making a fake magnetosphere is probably far future stuff. So I think any any colony on Mars is going to be um, confined to, you know, domes and things like that. Uh, let's see. If what we see of the universe is in the past because of the time the light takes it to reach us, could some far out stars and planets have detected not even exist anymore. Sure. I mean, there, there could have been, um, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, a supernova, um, and that supernova say it was, uh, 8,000 light years away, that supernova happened 8,000 years ago and that star is gone in real time. If you could actually go out there, it's, you would see a supernova remnant. Um, so that, yeah, it's very possible that that certain bodies anyway, no longer exist, but a lot of them, since we can kind of know the dynamics, of how they work, so like stars, um, we can reasonably say they're still there. You know, like a red dwarf, which can last for an unbelievably long amount of time because it's fully convective inside the star and it can efficiently use all its its uh, hydrogen. That way, you can you can reasonably say that's still there. Um, but a but a really wild, crazy star getting ready to go supernova, you know, giant star, you never know. 
um you're just sort of waiting and as i recall uh beetlejuice is one such star is that at some point it's going to explode and maybe it already has we don't know i think it's beetlejuice is the one that everybody was thinking about would do that all right how many satellites telescopes could be parked at l2 uh, my sense is a whole lot um and in fact uh bezos is thinking in terms of o'neill cylinders which would be gigantic you know um and putting those at at uh at l2 and that would be i mean i guess the the short answer is probably thousands and thousands if you managed them right and you could even put giant habitats there Let's see. Did you look into the contest NASA was having for 3D printed Mars habitats? Only vaguely. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with stuff like that. There's actually a guy, I saw him speak, and he um, he wants to use mushroom material as the ideal shielding on Mars. It's basically dried mushrooms. So there's a bunch of people out there that are, that are thinking on just how do you build a Mars habitat or a moon habitat? But I'm not really that familiar with that particular one. Yes, Ross, I am wearing a Pickle Rick shirt. John, as a sci-fi author, is it difficult to interview folks like Dr. Vanderberg and not let your nerd flag fly and want to immediately speculate about aliens and whatnot? That is a lot harder than you think. Um, I like to get in for example, with Dr. Vanderberg, I'd like to I'd like to go through all of the natural possibilities first because it's probably natural, very, very likely to be natural. But when I get to the study part, that's where I get excited and animated. And it it's, it does get uh, does get a little bit difficult to not fly the uh, nerd flag. Um, just because, I mean, it, it, that would be the greatest discovery in human history is finding evidence of an alien civilization so i mean what's more exciting than that but you have to temper that because either you know you don't want to sit there and say well something's aliens and then all of a sudden you find somebody thinks of a natural explanation and it's not aliens you know you don't want to be in that position you want to know unambiguously and um that's of course never happened I'm back, by the way. I'm just eating food. Ooh, food. <laughs> I haven't had food all day. Um, sorry. And, and Ross, you've been added as a VIP, so you, 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 he's good. <laughs> Rondo asks, with the addition of all these new satellites, do you think it will negatively affect our overall observation? Yes. Um, we, with these satellite constellations, and I know SpaceX takes a lot of heat for, for theirs, but there's several planned. And they will have to be accounted for essentially um so that's it's just going to have to be a, a question of accounting for all this stuff that said these satellites these these constellations are so low in low earth orbit that if we ever wanted them to go to go away they'll do so within a few years because drag and they're actually designed to deorbit themselves and have that ability so this is not something it's it's not like um making a highway cut or something like that that's going to be visible for you know hundreds of thousands of years this is just something that if we ever wanted it to go away we could make it go away um but it is it's, it's also something that the astronomers are going to have to uh, contend with for sure isn't it a one in five possibility that a star can collapse into a black hole without going supernova <sighs> So, nah. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, um, that's uh, so there's usually so again, there's cer certain things like with a mass limit that that changes all the time. So it's not a bad question at all. Well, the size, <laughs> the size, is, they're just because that number changes so much. We, we actually see that number with the mass <coughs> limitations and how big they can get and things like that. Um, you know, that that changes over time. So, uh, <laughs> the size were, it, it's just because we can't give a conclusive, like I, I, I would hesitate and obviously John would as well to give any kind of like, oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know. I would be hesitant on that one. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, understandings change 
And when you get into things like neutron stars and black holes, that's there's it changes. So, you know, you don't want to get you don't want to be too definitive about an object that's not very definitive, you know. Right. Yeah, no, those those things always change. And that's what I tell you guys is that there's not really um, we're finding that neutron stars are, are so weird and, and, and same with black holes. I mean, we're still learning a lot about that, like how black holes can actually destroy a galaxy. I was kind of telling you guys about that, too, how it can actually kick out a lot of the gas that galaxies need to do star formation or it can heat up the gas too much because star formation likes cold gas. It has to be cooled down. Gravity is going to grab a hold of it, and it's going to create stars. So if it gets too heated, too ionized, you can't use it for star formation. These are things like we're black hole stuff is really tough. <laughs> Would you? Wouldn't you agree? It's 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 almost like oh yeah. It's 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 insane to talk about. But are you just enthusiasts? I mean, this is pretty much what we do. Uh, this is our life. Yes, <laughs> yes. We eat, breathe, and uh, live science but in a different way than a scientist does we're presenters so they're popularizers so yeah. we bring you to science so yes. people are out there doing the science and we find ways to make it interesting for you guys he is a yeah he's a sci-fi author um people someone said earlier i would pay for him to just read some of his books which isn't a bad <laughs> idea have you thought about doing that well, yeah, um, actually, well, I mean, audiobooks. And I think what I'm actually going to do is I have two completed books that are out. And I think one of them, my earlier one, uh -huh. I think I'm just going to record it and give it away free on YouTube. Oh, man. Um, and then just uh, the other one, I'll my newer book, I'll record that as a as an audio book and for Audible or whatever. But uh, the original book, I think I'll I think I'm going to give that one away for free in its entirety with me reading it. Yeah. So right there, guys, but, I, there's his personal YouTube, and there's also the Event Horizon YouTube, Patreon, too. If you guys like what he does, support him there. But also subscribe on YouTube. Um, heck yeah. Okay, hell yeah, you mean? Hazzo's being super. You guys, we can swear here. Hazzo, by the way, was, thanks for the resub. <laughs> was there space pollution before an activity? How will we deal with this? You know what? The interesting thing about that is that there was an event that occurred in the early 20th century, and it was called the Great Meteor Procession. And it was, it appeared to the people that saw it as meteor after meteor after meteor, all falling in a line. And it lasted for some time doing this. And one idea is that it was a short-lived natural satellite that Earth had captured, and it finally fell in. And that's what they saw. Um, so... Yes, it is possible to have space debris without human activity. But now that we have human activity, we have a whole lot more space debris. And it is a problem in two ways. Because, number one, it's it's junk and it poses, you know, threats to living spacecraft or human missions. Um, and, and this has been a problem before in the past. I remember the space shuttle actually hit a paint chip at very high speed, this paint chip blew a crater in the front window of the shuttle, as I recall. So it's a problem, but it gets, becomes even more of a problem in a case where you get something called the Kessler syndrome, where one disintegrating satellite starts destroying other disintegrating satellites, sort of like a game of pool where everything's flying out, everything's hitting each other, and it's just cascades. And that could do some serious damage to certain orbits, low Earth orbit and um, things like that. The thing is that even if Kessler syndrome did happen, we would still be able to launch through it. So it does not ground us, but it does create, you know, it, it destroys something that's really useful, which is, you know, low Earth orbit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go on. So if black holes can be described with just three things, well, wait, wait, there's a better one. How do we know if there's space junk without exploration? Well, we know that there's space junk, we, so we complain about this all the time, right? You could say even even what Elon's putting up now with Starlink, right? Um, that that is that is technically space junk. Some people would say it. Um, I mean, we have a lot of stuff that's in low Earth orbit, but again, uh, 
I mean, so how do you feel about Starlink? I didn't even get to ask you that. Well, my feeling about Starlink is 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 sort of bittersweet because I really do like the idea of broadband internet anywhere on earth. And I think that that's going to outweigh the concerns uh, from astronomy about Starlink. So I am for Starlink because, you know, ultimately that could, that could help a lot of people, you know. Um, but at the same time, it's it's sort of it's sort of sad that it has to be this way. You know, that's the only way we can do it. But uh, ultimately, I'm supportive of it. Now, I do hope that SpaceX does everything they possibly can to minimize the effects of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're they're looking at low albedo and you know making satellites where they're not reflective, and they're looking oh, at stuff. someone just said that. Do satellites do satellites help prevent global warming by blocking sunlight? Uh, you need a really big one, but you can do it. Yeah. If you put if you put a uh, a uh, basically a a sunshade up there, you can drop the world's temperature. Yeah, and it's... that's that's a big issue because in in you know all you really need is a very thin sheet of material, and um, what happens if a nation state that's somewhat rogue decides to do that without the consensus of the international community? They say we're going. We're going, say, North Korea. We're going to solve global warming for you by putting up a sunshade, and there's nothing you can do about it except shoot it down. That's <laughs> sort of scary stuff to think about because, you know, I mean, that could be weaponized, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, again, like, so that's – but that's some of the concern, guys. It's like as, as our ice caps are melting and things like that, we're lowering that reflective surface that just bounces the sunlight off, so we absorb more of it, which is no bueno. Um, go on. It's much better to try to fix the problem through reducing emissions than to fix it through technology. That said, if we want to drop this planet's temperature, we can do it in a month. Mm -hmm. And there's multiple ways to do it. Um, basically, you could build a fleet of ships that evaporate seawater. And if you raise Earth's albedo by doing that, by banking more clouds, essentially, bam, problem solved. But... What's that do for hurricanes? What's that do for weather patterns? You know, there's all these questions that surround the technological solutions to anthropogenic climate change. Right. Someone just so said it's wouldn't... much better just to try to. I think we should just try to sequester carbon, get yeah. it out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, so you guys need to fund my Tesla. By the way, that was a total meme that's on here. So, you know, um, sort of a bad joke, but kind of funny at the same time. Um, so it wouldn't less like. <laughs> yeah, I too have an association with a certain type of car that I will not mention here. <laughs> the first thing that was said to me at the at the Astro Tour, mm -hmm. one of the Astro Tourists was behind me while I was checking into the hotel, and he's like, "Did you drive the LeBaron?" <laughs> and I'm like, man, I remember that. I remember that. Now it's all coming back to me. Mm -hmm. um, fossil fuels becoming expensive in many ways. Yeah, but it's not enough to like. I'm driving here in Boulder, Colorado, and I see a Hummer going by me. Oh man, I see it. I still see it, and I'm like, why do you need that shit? Um, it's it's a lot. You know, it's a lot of ego, guys. <laughs> the gas guzzling LeBaron. Gas guzzling LeBaron. <laughs> Um, if black holes can spin in different directions, clockwise, anti-clockwise, uh, or counterclockwise is what we would say instead of anti, uh, can magnetic poles, uh, shift reverse. So the magnetic poles, uh, yeah, they can move. So that's a whole, that's the whole scary thing about like, right, John, like these, that's the scary part is like having these poles in the direction facing towards earth. <laughs> right. Like, like yeah. that's what we're scared about is if we have one of these stellar mass black holes or, not even stellar mass oh. black holes, but you know that pole is yeah, right the, next to you. <laughs> there was a there was a paper that came out before the Event Horizon Telescope's uh, results for the imaging of the black hole. Uh -huh. Somebody else did a sort of image of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, yeah. and it may be pointed at us. The relativistic <laughs> jet of the Milky Way may be pointed at us, oh, no. and that was the result. So yeah, that's disconcerting i don't know if it could do anything at this distance but it's yeah it's disconcerting 
Yeah, because that, that, I mean, that's one of those things I, I wouldn't say so much with like, and he's right with the, it would be more with those AGNs, the, the active galactic nucleus, that would be a real threat because then you've got that x-ray radiation that's coming right for your face if, if that those poles align. But so far, we've seen that's a pretty rare thing, even with other galaxies. Um, so we're not too concerned again, but that's, that's a distance thing. So we're only what, like 26,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's hope it don't boot up again. Yeah. Let's hope it, it stays on Weight Watchers for at least like, I don't know, fuck, like, what would you say? I'd say at least another hundred years just to make sure we're, we're good. You know? Oh, we're going to be good. What's going to be bad for this galaxy is when we merge with Andromeda. That's oh. going to be the bad one because that's that's going to turn this galaxy into a quasar. And um, yeah, it's not good. Yeah, but we got some time for that. We do. We have like 5 billion years roughly. Yes. But that number also changes all the time. And everybody's yeah, like, yeah, the, that there's actually Some people think that, that, that we're actually close enough now where the merger has actually started. Yeah, that, I've heard so. that. I've heard that. That's it. I'm leaving. No. <laughs> a few billion. Yeah, about 5 billion. That, that's the kind of the, the interesting thing is that we're almost as far as you know again we get so many figures about the merger and, and and it's really cool i'm 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 open to understanding galactic mergers aka we call it galactic sex here john just so you know because it, it, it's a hot mess it's you know it's a long courting so it's not like you know first night whatever it's this is a long thing that happens wait it started potentially there's some figures uh, go on can you can you expand on that john well i mean well, the first the first thing is 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 uh, it is very complicated, you know, when these when galaxies merge. But the end result essentially is the supermassive black holes at the center of each galaxy merge, and that you end up with a an elliptical galaxy that's dead. All of the dust and star forming stuff, you know, within the galaxy, it gets blown out, and you just end up with a a quote unquote dead uh, elliptical galaxy. Um, and during this, of course, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's going to happen. You know, stars are going to get tossed out and all kinds of things. But um, at that point, though, when when that actually happens and the, you know, the two galaxies merge and go quasar, it, that's basically going to probably end all life in the Milky Way if it's if it's still there. Um, yeah. And we were talking us. we were talking about quasars. Right. And, and I was telling people. So you have different versions of. Of, of active galaxies. So you have a radio galaxy. Give me give me your, what's a radio galaxy? Well, it's a galaxy emitting a lot of radio waves. Right. Um, and then you've got different types of quasars. You've got... Blazars? Uh, yeah. And you've got uh, cold quasars and mm -hmm. warm ones, or yep. if you prefer, red or blue ones. And these are just quasars in different stages of development. Um, but usually all of this stuff, when we talk about that, it usually has something to do with a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. It's usually something black hole related, which really shows that black holes aren't these these just passive things that hide in, you know, the centers of galaxies obscured by dust. They rule basically everything. Um, <clears throat> and that they, you know, they, they affect... Everything that happens in a galaxy across its life, it's, you know, somehow involved with that black hole. Yeah, it's going to be a ginormous quasar. Yeah, and, and, and it's, again, like, there's different stages. And, John, if you need to, like, get up and, and like, move around and stuff, like, do not feel. Cause, so, John's, I'm just going to let everybody know again. I'm going to reintroduce you several times. Um, so, John is a YouTuber on here. Um, why, don't you, why don't you just go, go take a break real quick and come I'll, right back? I'll be right back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna turn off the cam for you. You're good. Um, and muting the audio. So, um, John is, and I'll show you guys around real quick so you guys can know who he is because he is awesome. Um, and I met him. Uh, it's funny. The story behind John and I is we had to share a a very awkward. Well, not between John and I, but the the driver of um, our vehicle. <laughs> who was offering us Oreos, butterscotch, and gum, which I have plenty of all the time, you know? Uh, but yeah, like, it was, it was a very, 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 just very interesting ride. We were laughing the whole time, because John and I both hadn't eaten the whole time, right? We, we, we arrive, it's mid-afternoon, we hadn't eaten, 
And then we get in the car, and this guy's like, Oreos. Do you guys want some Oreos? They're double stuffed. And I was like, no, we're good. We're good. I'm good. Are you good? And John's like, I haven't eaten. I'm like, yeah, me too. I'm, 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 not, I'm not ready to get diabetes. Are you ready to get diabetes? And John's like, I'm not ready to get diabetes. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. So, so we're good on this. And he's like, take it. And we're like, okay, all right. All the time he's speaking um, Egyptian Arabic, which was super interesting with like, you know, little notes, uh, Vivaldi playing in the background, maybe a little bit of Mozart, maybe some Bach. And, and, and he's offering all of these special cookies. I wish, but we didn't need it. So John and I, we're laughing the whole time because we, again, we don't want to get diabetes and that glycemic load. We both know that if you haven't eaten food and someone offers you Oreos, no bueno, no good, just pass up on it. Yeah, no, so, so, yeah, we passed up on it. Well, I mean, I think he actually ate the Oreo. He did. I, you know, he, he ate it. I put it in my almond bag. I had a bag of almonds and I just put it in the bag. <laughs> he ate it and then he fell asleep faster than I did. And I was like, hey, hey. See, I consumed several Oreos. He took one for the team because the guy would not stop pressuring me the whole entire time. And I was like, John, help me out. But no, it was great. <laughs> they were double stuffed. <laughs> they were. This was a great driver, though. So we got to spend um, from from LAX, which is hell. Um, I think we both believe that if there is a black hole on Earth, it is LAX. And um, and John, I, I don't know if you're back. I will bring you in in just a second when I can kind of see him moving around the background there. But um, but yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is posting. What is this YouTube thing? Set set what set on fire mix. Nice sweet dude. Um, I believe it's called alcohol. So we didn't have alcohol on this trip. I it, I mean on the car ride. So once we got there, I was like, John, I know we just met, but let's go by the fire pit and hang out and uh, you know. So hold on, I think John's coming. Oh yeah. So it's good. I, I want him to feel comfortable and being able to move around and stuff, guys. It's super cool that we actually... So normally John doesn't show his face because his voice is wonderful, right? If my voice was... I mean, wonder if my stream was like this, guys. You, no one would watch, right? Let's be real, all right? Listen to my voice. No one would like to hear my voice. My voice is not that great, right? So, but John, I'm going to just go ahead and unmute John. Without showing his cam, John, say something. Hello, everybody. See unsubscribe see already already people are like i'm out i know see john john's pretty we, there's no cam right now for either of us and john wins john just say something really cool about the universe your fun fact about the universe just throw something out there the universe is very large and could be so large it's infinite Let's see sold subscribed if he had 20 youtube channels i would already yeah true see <laughs> see people already know Okay, now we're back on cam. So he's his camera doesn't need to be mine. He's not he's not a cam streamer, guys. He doesn't do this. Whoa, I'm telling you guys. I told you. So when we watch his videos, it's about that voice. His money is in his voice. That's 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 where it's at. Selling the universe, which it, I mean, again, we just do this because we like the universe. But if it makes us money, that makes us happy because we're happy doing what we love to do. There's you know there's, about that car, right? Yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I can't stress enough how funny that driver was. I know he just had his own certain sense of humor, and he kept producing candy and cookies from every orifice of, this, <laughs> of the front seat of this car, and which, which which was actually a brand new car. Which he didn't fail to let us know right away, right? Yeah. Oh, he was very proud of it. I forget what it was. Was it a Lincoln or something? It was like and, a 2019 Lincoln something. Yeah, and he was. Uh, he had more candy and cookies than any human. I mean, it was like stockpiling for the zombie apocalypse, and he's going to spend it in his in his new car. And um, yeah, he was actually he was a very pleasant driver. I liked that guy. I can't he remember was. his name now, but oh man, you knew and you knew. You, I you, knew. You, I remember, but it's it. passed out of it's passed out of memory now. <laughs> um, but I was like, if I ever, if I need more rides around this town, I'm calling oh, yeah. that guy. Yeah, that guy, and he got us there in record time. I was telling people, and and Papa Lito, thank you for the tier two. Can we get sorry, Hail Sagan, Gold Sagans, 
Gold Sagans, guys. I'm here for John. Okay. Take back the Gold Sagans. That was what his resub message was. I'm here for John. Get Papalito out of here. He's just here for John. All right. I'm kidding. Thank you, Papalito. And we're so, I'm so glad that John's finally here because I've, I've wanted, this is going to be a thing that we just do um, randomly. Randomly. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're just having fun with it. And I'm so glad that so many of you guys are actually hanging out with us because he's, he's beyond wonderful. Uh, and Kez, 14 <coughs> months. Thank you. Um, Sagan <laughs> rescinded. Don't rescind the Sagans. <laughs> but no, so, so I, yeah, the guy, he was, we were going to say something about that. So he, he was that driver and John, I've got to admit there's, there's, there's a, there's a person on this planet that pisses me off and I don't, I didn't get the, I didn't get to tell you this, but it's a person that takes the merging lane. Okay. And will ride it all the way up like an <laughs> entitled piece of shit. Yes. <laughs> he was one of those but he got us there faster and i don't know how i feel about it because it got us to where we needed to go faster and i feel like i'm i'm almost I'm almost like vicariously bad because i was like yeah that's right cut all these people off at least i'm not doing it <laughs> what i'll never get used to is the motorcycles in california that they can actually go in between the cars and have their own sort of little lane so while you're stuck in grid in, in Los Angeles gridlock, like that was the motorcycle just zip on past. That would never be allowed in this state. I know. <laughs> in a million years. It, no, it was it was it, and he was good though. Like he did you notice how 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 much he monitored people coming mm -hmm. in and out of that I mean go well it's not in a lane, it's between lanes, but he was right. good at moving over every single time. As a writer in California, I actually hated that. It's so dang I, I yeah. I, you know, I wonder what the mortality rate is with California motorcyclists. I'm sure it's pretty high because people don't use their signals and everybody's in a rush and yeah, but the, but his car, he was telling us this too, this is a little bit of a segue, but this always happens and, and this is going to happen when I have people that I, I actually enjoy that are friends on here and also space enthusiasts. He, the guy was telling us how his car actually just like automatically broke like it, it created it like slowed down when there was a proximity issue with the car in front of him right yeah it did it, it, it had automatic braking and he's like i'm not doing that just so you know just so you know i'm not doing that yeah. yep here's an oreo <laughs> yeah <laughs> more oreos double stuffed <laughs> take one okay anyways can't do that in colorado we also don't have a helmet law right which does California have a helmet law? I hope I they don't do. know. I know Illinois doesn't. Yeah, you, I, I would hope. Okay, they do. Okay, I was about to say, fuck. Because then, then, then we're talking a real mortality rate. You want to boost those things? You know, just take no helmet and you can go in between lanes. Um, it's actually weird. You go over into Illinois. Yeah. CLBS, and you will actually see people riding motorcycles without helmets. It is the most dangerous. I mean... Motorcycles are dangerous anyway, but yeah. this is like way, way over the top dangerous, which is weird because otherwise Illinois is, is a state that will regulate everything except motorcycle helmets. Very strange. That's really weird because I guess apparently Colorado doesn't either. Yeah, that's insane. Wait, uh, in Colorado, you don't have to register 50cc or under also. What? Okay. When I moved to Texas, seeing riders without helmets freaked me out. Yeah, that shouldn't be allowed. You know, now that I think about it, I think I, I, uh, yeah, I think I, I've been on the back of a motorcycle, but when I was younger, just going around the block. So, Florida, you can drive a go kart on ninety five. Well, it's Florida. I'm doing that, Ross. <laughs> Next time I'm down there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna rent a go kart <laughs> and I'm gonna drive it on the highway. <laughs> Oh my God! I mean, and, and Ross, you better you better video that. That better be a thing that we all see. That better be a thing. I just told Dustin that we're live on stream, so Dustin can hop in here and be like, "Oh hell yeah!" Oh yeah! <laughs> oh hell yeah! Oh um, hell yeah! And guys, like both of us, we'll, we'll we'll be definitely doing a lot of stuff with OPT. Um, oh sure. Oh yeah, both of us, both of us. You're gonna see a lot of JMG in your life. I hope hope you guys are all okay with this and you're adapting well. It seems like you guys are doing just fine. Um. If it goes fast enough, what's fast? What's fast? Well, I imagine, well, I mean, some go-karts are fast. I mean, if you can get up above 45 miles per hour, I guess you'd probably be okay. Um, 
I, you know, this reminds me of something I saw when I was a kid one time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in Nevada, and my dad worked as a military contractor. And um, anyway, they they had an M1 tank, and they had to bring it on the highway briefly. So they had a sign, you know, do not approach the back of this tank because it has a um, – it, these things run on, on – um, they run on uh, – uh, I can't remember the exact name for it. Basically, it's a it, – anyway, it produces a lot of heat out of the back of the tank. And some stupid person in a car went and got right up behind the tank as it was on the highway and totally melted the grill <laughs> of it. Um, it runs on a turbine, basically, is how, how those things work. Oh. And, um, and that, that massive exhaust coming out of the back of the thing melted the grill. <laughs> And it had to stop, and everybody stopped, and the tank had to pull over on the side of the road. <laughs> just, just only in Nevada can things like that happen. Only in Nevada. <laughs> it stays there. Dustin's in here. Dustin responded yeah, immediately. Yeah, it, it would have been one of the early M1 Abrams tanks. Yeah. Um, and what my dad did was he, he worked on hydraulics and the design of the trailer that carries these things. Yeah. So Dustin's in here. So two of my favorite people Dustin. right there. Fist bump. I, I just gave him a fist bump to the can. Yeah, fist bump to <laughs> Dustin. <laughs> you just got a JMG fist bump. What, Dustin? Get out of here. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> um, M1s run on Honeywell AGT 1500. Turbine that can run gas on diesel or jet fuel. Oh, man. Well, you see, this is what this is what I love about this is like you can. So this is what helps with the astronomy stuff is that you can take breaks and actually be a human every now and again. They'll actually talk to you about this stuff because other people in here are nerds, too. <laughs> and it's wonderful. Yeah, it's fun to do stuff. You know, my, my, my content doesn't really lend itself well to going on cam. But when you never go on cam, um, people think you're a robot you know, a robotic voice or something like that. Wait, you're not and, a robot? Uh, you're not a robot? Yeah, so I like to go on and on various, you know, any, anywhere I can just, just to show that I'm not a robot. Um, although this is not the first time this has happened. My uh, my first showing of my face on YouTube, that was Fraser. Oh, Fraser. And he was not gentle. Oh, man. Of course. Of course. Love JMG. JMG Robot. Um, he's kind of like Bender, a robot that runs on alcohol. He wasn't even drinking ahead of time, Brando. Brando's talking about himself. Brando, <laughs> an actual human. No, but see, that's that's what I was telling people. So anybody that comes in, they're like, you know what, your, your webcam, like this isn't what he does. Like again, his voice, it's good. That's all he needs. But I I, I, I like seeing his face. So So you guys can shut up. But no one's really said anything except like one lame troll just someone coming in just being like i'm just gonna piss on this because i can what's up everyone you all are so spoiled to be able to just jump in here and listen to people like sky and jmg talk you better be subscribing <laughs> well just- oh, Dustin, i gotta I'm, I'm gonna be getting in touch with you soon we've been thinking of ideas of yeah. uh what, what to do with um with astronomy stuff with you guys and oh we got gosh. some good ones what, were you, what, what are excited. we gonna what are we it's a pretty face jmg that's what i'm saying dustin that's what i'm saying fist bump you know um, we just, why, why can't we do like group calls, <laughs> push efficiency to its max. Um, and maybe his brain, oh, his brain's great. So he also, guys, he's a science fiction writer. Um, I don't think I have the links to your books in the JMG thing. I don't think I do. they're real easy to find. Just search, uh, search my name on Amazon and I'll, they'll come up. Yeah. But we'll make that link longer. Cause you know, people need things to click on. Yeah. I, uh, there should be a way. I'll, I'll get with you later and send you some links. Um, yeah. Or Ross. Ross, you can find me on Discord. Or Ross, yeah. Ross uses Discord, doesn't he? Ross definitely knows Discord better than I do, and I'm on Discord right now. So if I can figure it out, Ross will ace it. Wait, watch this. Watch what Joe does. Joe's Joe's like, I got him. So Joe, aka my Ross. So Joe does a lot of this stuff. Well, even though well, Lottie's is the one that made the link for you. Um, but Joe, Joe, watch Joe. will just do it. Let's do it. I don't even know, need to know what it is. I'm down. Yeah, no, we should schedule a call. All three, all three of us. Um, Dustin. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. What if we bring JMG to TwitchCon? 
How many of you guys would like to see JMG at TwitchCon with us? Are, are any of you guys going? Because um, Dustin and Ian are going. Obviously, I am. Um, but I don't know how many of you guys are going to go to that that you'd like to see. What's TwitchCon? Shut up, Mossberg. I haven't decided yet. G JMG at TwitchCon? Pog, Pog Ian? That'd be awesome. I'll be at TwitchCon. <laughs> What's Twitch? Okay, guys. So when is TwitchCon and where? It's the end of September and in San Diego. So right where, right where Dustin is. Wait. We're just going to crash, you know, Dustin's house. It's the 27th through the 29th. Did you actually pull out a paper schedule? Are you looking at a piece uh, of no, paper? No, I am. Um, <laughs> He's looking, looking at, at the dates. I'm looking at the dates oh. of the Mars Society Conference, which is in the same place. And that's October 17th through 20th. But oh. I very, very well may be attending that. What if you just made um, it like a, you know, a thing where you're just kind of hanging out there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sitting in California for a month. I mean, uh, we need him there. That's uh, Dustin said that. Yeah, because because I might just be, uh, you know, Dustin's like, yeah, you're going to stay with me. I'm like, yeah, we're going to stay. We're going to stay there. So Dustin's in San Diego area. So. Well, it wasn't very expensive to um, fly um, for the Astro Tour, so I'm not opposed. Yeah, no, it wasn't expensive to fly. It's expensive to stay, but there's other people I could sell, like, where I'm staying. I could sell basically where I'm staying. So I could be like, hey, go, 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 go put this back up. You're going to get someone else. Um, go say hi to the Sushi Dragon at TwitchCon. He, this dude, is, I, I know who he is. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I think it'd be great to get a bunch of these people that are science influencers. Uh, God, I hate using that word. Can I just take that back? I hate saying science influencer. Um, it's probably because I've read that too much. Wait, I just saw three of your books for $0 uh, for Kindle Unlimited. Did you get anything if, for that if I download? Yes, you can download to your heart's content because what happens there in Kindle Unlimited is Amazon creates a fund each month and depending on your downloads, Amazon pays you. So Amazon's taken the hit on that um, because Kindle Unlimited is a, you know, fees based, you know, you pay a certain amount to be a member. So yes, we do get paid. So feel free by all means to download from Kindle Unlimited. Can you, can you list the, the books um, that you have published and, 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 and again, this is going to be added guys to his command, but Joe's like already on it right now. See, look, I'll be right back. One second. Yeah. You know, okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go ahead and mute him too. So no one can see, uh, and Dustin, I'm, I'm going to basically throw my Airbnb out into everything. Oh, he's back. He's back. I just want to you just no one wants to see jmg get up out of his seat you know um um <laughs> wait he's gonna show you guys oh so you want a tiny earl that joe but you know that okay books the books. first one books is called the salvagers and i wrote it in 2013 wait wait let me see that cover art bring it closer Holy shit. Yeah, you're going to have to look at the stream to see what you're looking at, but it's yeah. okay. You've got a little bit of a delay. Not too basically much. Wow. Basically like Space it. Station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this? Who, who did your cover art? Believe it or not, um, the, uh, for this one, it was uh, a friend of mine that's a just a graphic design artist. Wow. And it just kind of looked kind of cool, and we were like, yeah, that's about it. And what's that? Um, what's the premise of that book? The premise of this book is it is I will read it. The blurb. Oh yeah, please do. In the year twenty two fifty eight, the mining ship Cape Hatteras attempted to return home carrying a cargo of gold. It disappeared without a trace. Two centuries later, space salvager Captain Cameron Camden Hunter, God, I forgot my own character's name. Jeez, finds the <laughs> ship far from where it was predicted to be, and he finds someone else there but they didn't come for the gold. And I actually had a sort of a subplot because everybody's always saying, no, no one will go and, and mine the solar system from gold, either, even though it's all there. So I just kind of put it as a, a MacGuffin, as a kind of a joke that, that people would still be interested in gold and 
the uh, 400 years in the future. Now they're like helium. Helium. <laughs> yeah, helium three. <laughs> Get that helium. <laughs> Uh, that's actually brilliant. Yeah, so let's go into the next one. You have to read this. Oh, okay. So this is what you usually end the Event Horizon slash your own YouTube as yes. well. Yes. Supermind is... All right, so the Salvagers is a space opera, and I'll eventually write another installment to it, but the this that basically is, is sort of just fun, whereas this is heavy, high-concept, um, deep science fiction um so that would be you know this is the current one and a blurb on this one the age of biological augmentation and post-humanity has dawned amid the social upheaval that results scientist greg corbin is reaching what he believes is the apex of his career with the help of a living supercomputer he intends to create a computer simulation of the universe so accurate that even humanity's past present and future will be revealed but then his life collapses around him, and he is faced with a decision that will determine the fate of the one he loves. Wow. Stop laughing, I'm not, Joe. Joe double... Joe double copied your link, so when you had your command in here, it was like literally the whole chat. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, so, so I have a question, though, and I do have to ask this, because it's been on my mind ever since listening to you through the interwebs. When did you know you had such an amazing voice, like for talking? Like, how did you find this out? Because you had someone had to have told you. Someone had to have. It's not like you were listening to yourself and you're like, I like listening to myself. <laughs> you know, I never really made the connection that the voice was going to be the draw. I just knew that it was deep. Um, but I, what I, what I did know. And this was years ago because I did, you know, I'd had a briefly had a podcast and done other stuff. Um, I did know that I could, I could talk. So that's sort of, but I, even to this day, I don't really look at the voices being something that I, it was, it is not of my doing, put it that way. This is genetics and age that sort of matured this voice. It, when I was in my twenties, it wasn't this good. Yeah. See, no, no, no. So Chess even says, I need an audio book of these. And this is what I'm saying. So he says that he's done, how many of you done in an audio form? None, none yet. So none, none. Um, cheers to that, by the way. Cheers. Oh, cheers. JMG cheers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to no audio books yet. Hopefully um, that happens. Well, here's the deal with audio books is that I could have released them, but it would have been somebody else reading them. And I think the thing is, most people want me to read my books in audio format. So I had to get an assembled, an audio setup that had a sufficient noise floor, you know, mm -hmm. very quiet noise floor. And um, I just now have that. Um, and you can see, this is what that all looks like. Wow. So you can see that there's just all kinds of stuff going on here as far as like, audio is... goes and noise floors and all that stuff. And what kind of mic do you use? This is an AKG Perception 200, which is a very unusual mic to use, but it, it reacts with my voice very well. But it is fundamentally a, designed for miking guitar amps, believe it or not. And I can bring it up and show you probably. Oh, man. Yeah, you can. And uh, I like your choice of your uh, your pop filter, by the way. I'm just going to say I think you've yeah. chosen well. I feel this, I might be a little biased, but, you know, it's, you know, it's just because great minds think alike. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, but I can actually bring in a second pop filter. When okay. I will do well, really I could super... do that, too. It's just it's mine's in a box somewhere and I could do that, too. It's just probably in the basement, probably like with a lot of spiders and stuff. You know, I'll just bring up the spiders. <laughs> Um, uh, such a great voice. No, it's, it is like it again. So everybody that like when you guys, and this will be our meme here, cause we're going to be watching a lot of his stuff, uh, because homegirl needs help. Okay. When we talk about astronomy for hours and hours and hours, this, these people that are, I know, um, they're nothing but a blessing to, to actually like, just have like their content that I'm like, here's a cool video. And it's actually fucking interesting. Um, so you know, they're, 
we'll have him on here quite a bit. This is something that we're going to get used to. Spider web. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, but yeah, this is, this is, this is different for him. So I appreciate everybody here and that's hanging out and, and having, wait, 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 there was some question that came in that was about space. We can go back to it a bit. Do you think we should focus on solving? It's not a bad question. Of course, when coming in with a great question, because he always does. Do you think we should focus on solving Earth's environmental issues over colonizing Mars? AKA Musk's big push. I think we need to do both. Um, in my, in my, uh, in my view, Musk is hedging the bet, hoping, uh, and it's a big stretch, hoping that he, we can be a multi-planet species because not only because of, you know, what we do to this planet, but in that this planet could get hit by an asteroid and nothing we could do about it right now. If we're a multi-planet species, then we're essentially safe. Um, the human civilization will not end if one planet, whether it's Earth or Mars, gets smacked by an asteroid. That said, we do need to do way better of a job at um, managing what we're doing here on Earth. Um, it's just, it's, it's reality. And a lot of people get caught up in their political ideologies and everything and form, you know, opinions based on that instead of the actual science. Um, but the science is, is there and we need to do, we need to do better, but, but we can do all of these things at once because, um, solving them, we are, we are rich enough to do two things at once, put it that way as a civilization. Oh yeah. The problem is, is the people in charge, we, it, like that's the thing. And, it, and there's, I mean, we're not going to get into politics because John and I both firmly agree on this. Fuck politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fuck politics. And this is where him and I were like fist bumping, even though we didn't fist bump ever because we just didn't probably mentally. Cause it's just one of those things where everybody thinks they have the right fucking idea. So how do you compete with that? Right. All we know is that if it helps humanity in, in things like space and helps earth and prolonging earth and making earth something that's livable and whatever, there really is no, this isn't a partisan issue. This isn't like a party thing. You know what I mean? No. And in fact, it was sort of co-opted by the parties so they could <laughs> fight about something and have a wedge issue. Um, and I, I just, I just don't like when that happens. As a matter of fact, I mentioned that in the debate. Do you remember back when, well, I remember, um, <laughs> back when we were destroying the ozone layer with Freon, mm -hmm. everybody came to a consensus and fixed the problem apparently before the politicians got it, a hold of it and could fight about it and prolong it. So the issue got fixed, right? Mm -hmm. And now the ozone layer is recovering still, but we stopped pumping CFCs. If we had continued to do that and not um, regulated and changed over to do different, uh, different chemicals that we use, then this planet's ozone layer would be so damaged at this point that it would take centuries to recover, if ever. And we would have to be walking around with sunblock because the, the uh, ultraviolet light would be just everywhere. It would have fundamentally changed how we live life here on planet Earth. Anthropogenic climate change is the same thing. It will fundamentally eventually change how we live on this planet and how we conduct life and business. It probably won't cause our extinction, but um, it's better to fix it early than it is late. Right. And unfortunately, it got caught up in the political system. So now it's essentially unfixable until the very last minute, which we may be getting close to for all we know. So, um, yeah. So I'm not going to even this is this is no joke. And, and this is not to pull on everybody's pathos. I'm not trying to pull on the heartstrings here. I'm not trying to appeal to you guys. But this actually happened this morning um, when talking to my daughter. So she's pretty big about being kind to Earth because, again, she's six. So she doesn't, you know, her her understanding of how things work. She gets really sad about uh, seeing people litter. She actually picks things up. She's telling me that she actually makes stuff like arts and crafts out of litter. But but like safe stuff, like obviously this is very well managed. Um, but she was telling me, she said, well, I can't wait for my generation to be able to travel space. And she said this all on her own this morning, like out of nowhere. She does these weird things where I'm like, is this real life? I don't know if it's. I don't even know what's happening, but she said, I'm so excited for my generation because I feel like we're going to be able to, well, she didn't say I feel like, but we're going to be able to go to space and explore space. And I said, yes, maybe. And she goes, why not? Why not? And I said, 
because we're hurting earth a lot right now and there's people that just don't want to recognize this and she she actually started crying total mental hmm. breakdown like just just started crying but i love planet earth i love it i don't want to hurt it and i'm like yeah that's why it's up to you um to you and your friends to do things that 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 work for it so that you guys can be here and we can travel space and we can have a a place where we can actually do that from and then that's what, i mean total meltdown i'm not even kidding guys it's so earth isn't space checkmate fuck you get out of here earth is space what do you think you're on a fucking rock and where where do you think you are you think you're inside the black hole no that's where my my socks are that's where, that's where my lost socks that i never find that's earth is in space are you kidding um but you can you can fair enough yeah no earth is in space that's all we got dude this is all we have right now so yeah she like she had this meltdown and I, I wish these are moments i wish that there was like a camera on me because i'm like i don't know where this is coming from like i don't and, and i never thought she would talk about her generation with space like i don't know where she put the two together there at all like, I don't, I don't tout that with her too much. I mean, we do talk about that a bit. Um, uh, cause she's going to Hawaii soon. So I was talking about the tides, all kinds of stuff. I was talking about, um, the coral reefs out there and things like that. So I don't know if she's like putting things together on her own. Yeah, tell me, well, tell me the last time you met a kid that started freaking out about that though. Like being like, I, want earth to stay around so that we can actually go and colonize space that's what blew my mind that's where but but i don't doubt it with her but at the same time i was just like what are you what are you on about but but she was right so i encouraged it and i said it's okay to feel sad um and she was then that's when she started talking about all kinds of things like you know birds getting trapped in plastic bags and stuff like that so i hope it's so yeah so to go into crazy sci-fi territory Please do. That may end up being a reality is that if you think about it, and this is part of Blue Origin's, you know, Bezos' vision. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, creating O'Neill cylinders and artificial habitats in space could actually create environments better than Earth. And in other words, you, you can completely control the weather inside the thing. You can completely control everything. Um, you wouldn't even have garden weeds as you were, you know, growing your food on the interior of the cylinder. Mm -hmm. At some point, the O'Neill cylinder looks a lot better than living on Earth. So is it possible in the far future that Earth will be a nature preserve that no one lives on and that we're all living out at um, L2 next to the moon or out in these habitats? And that's interesting. It's an interesting thought because at some point it becomes maybe not worth it to live on Earth. And very few people might choose to do it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, oh man, do you know how weird we would look if we had to go into these lava tubes or even, even underground in on, on the moon, right? I mean, cause we'd have to, there's no atmosphere. I mean, evolution. <laughs> oh man. Th that's a book you could write about. <laughs> well, it is. And, and you can actually see an O'Neill cylinder. An example of one is features fairly prominently in, um, in the expanse. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, they they do have the elongated people, silent running. I lived in a lava tube. No way. Uh, is that Isaac Arthur's spread? What? No, this is this is JMG Coochie. His name is Coochie Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord. I know. I know. This is no, not JMT. It's not a drug. Coochie, coochie. No, this is JMG. This is John Michael Godier. Um, I think we should first. I'm gonna actually get up and stretch, and then you can take a break, and then we can actually you can say, hey, I need to wrap up, and you know, what do you, what do you, what, you know, we'll do that right now. What do you think? Like another thirty? You got another thirty? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I might have to get another bottle of wine, but I'll well, do that I, when I. Yeah. No, that's totally appropriate. Let me make sure that I have this, because because it's. Again, guys, this is what science communicators do is we have uh, the, we got each other's back so he can he can take over chat. He, he sat here. How long did you talk on my stream? Oh, at the, <laughs> at the, uh, <laughs> oh, God, oh, that was several hours. Yeah, that was awesome. That was though. Hours. People and... people were asking for that whole bit. And I'm like, guys, there there was so much I couldn't even put that somewhere. 
Yes, and I definitely was hitting the wine hard that night. So was I. Actually, I was hitting hitting the whiskey eventually. Well, I know because we we both, well, him and I, so we didn't know, but we were both going to be up at like 4.30. So yeah. I, I knew, but I didn't know you were going to be. So I never went to bed. I, I continued to party up until 4 a.m. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, us, us science people are actually pretty interesting. I don't think people believe this, though. I think on Twitch, they just think we're boring and that we have no life. And Jame and G and I party till four. I, yeah. I actually have a witness. Brando was with me that whole time. So Yeah, yeah. He is a witness. <clears throat> so I'm going to let you guys talk to him. Ask all your science questions or just shoot the shit. Like, again, ask questions about how he gets started in sci-fi and writing books for it. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Like, who actually thought, hey, you should... I would ask him, if I were one of you guys, how did you start making YouTube videos, first and foremost? I'll let you go with that first. Well, I, <laughs> I, it was actually kind of an accident. I started out with uh, asking myself, okay, how do I use social media to um, promote my books? And that was the first question. And then I thought, well, I don't really like Facebook all that much, um, and I don't really like Twitter all that much and all of that. And I was like, well, what about YouTube? And um, I essentially was like, well, what, what kind of a YouTube channel could I do? And this would have been February-ish of 2016. And um, yeah, well, I decided I got angry because there was a bunch of uh, conspiracy type UFO videos regarding KIC 8462852 Tavi Star. And I'm like, I'm gonna actually post a science video and actually explain what this thing is. And that started the channel. It never, it, it got way more views than I thought it would. And I was just like, well, I'll make more videos. And now I'm at about 230, 240 videos. Uh, what got me into astronomy, physics, et cetera? Uh, one specific moment, I was always interested, kind of interested in science. I like geology. And, you know, my parents bought me this uh, when I was around nine, 10. They bought me this package of, you know, you get a microscope and you get a small telescope, like a 30 millimeter telescope. And initially I was more interested in the microscope because I wanted to look at rocks and stuff like that close up. And then I thought, well, I'll take this telescope out one night. And I had a little booklet or some a sort of a, you know, a, a dial type thing that showed you what was in the night sky that came with the telescope. And I, I saw Saturn uh, it, that was, you know, going to be there. And, um, I looked at Saturn and all of a sudden it looked like Saturn. And I thought before I was like, oh, this is probably just going to be a blob or something. And I look in there and it was Saturn in all of its glory with the rings, you know, even through a 30 millimeter telescope. And that that's what hooked me on the astronomy. And I, I've never looked back since. So what else? Questions. If you had to guess at the first confirmed strong evidence of life, how long and what type of evidence is the most likely scenario? It is going to be microbial, I think, because we have a very good chance of finding evidence of microbial life on Mars or having once been on Mars. Alternately, Europa. We have evidence that this place could support some kind of microbial life. So I think that's how it'll happen. We'll actually see microbial life first. That said, there's a wild card because at any moment, the various SETI programs could find something and evidence of an, of an alien civilization. And um, yeah, so that it could happen either way. But if I had a bet, I think it's going to be through the microbes. And yes, Bill Clinton actually did announce the discovery of alien life already. Um, the story behind that was... Um, there are Martian meteorites here on Earth that are blasted off the surface of Mars and they land here. And they show what could be evidence of fossilized uh, microbial life. This is very contentious to this day, 25 years after it was first, actually, believe it or not, it was the first notice in the 60s, but it was brought back into the uh, public arena in the 90s. And it's un it's unsolved to this day that, these, that we actually may already have evidence of Martian bacteria. Um, Allen Hills, yeah, 82001 or something like that. Um, so what happened was since it was a NASA study that, that was actually looking at these meteorites, they, when they found it, they, uh, 
you know, the U.S. government announced it and Bill Clinton came out and did a press conference and all that stuff when he was president. So this has to confound conspiracy theorists because that makes the U.S. government the only entity to ever announce the existence of alien life. But maybe it was erroneously. So they jumped to the gun. So all the people that are saying that they're hiding something or whatever, well, they were more than happy to throw it out there before it was even proven, you know? So I think it's just sort of interesting. Yeah, you know, when I, that's kind of interesting because I didn't get to see the space race of the 60s. I was born in 1975. But it by the time I got into space, it was, you know, the 1980s. And I was just like, it was this this amazing period of time where we were doing something amazing. And then the time I was in, we weren't doing much anything except launching the shuttle. Couldn't go past low Earth orbit. And I used to pine away for the Saturn V that they would bring it back or pull them out of mothballs because there was, I think, two of them in mothballs at that time. And, um, <laughs> yeah, only, only in modern times am I excited again about what we're doing in space. Well, let's see. Anybody else have any science questions? Um, do I have a guilty pleasure of conspiracy theories? Um, the thing about conspiracy theories is that the biggest conspiracy of all is that is, is being perpetrated by the people that make up the conspiracy theories because there's a lot of money in, you know, if you make up conspiracy theories on YouTube or fake UFO footage or do something like that and you monetize it, make a lot of money. And before then people were selling books, you know, they were writing books about ufology and all that. And basically you could hoax anything you want, stick it in the book and it sells. Now, that's not to say there weren't honest people in those fields. There were. And as a matter of fact, one of them just died a few days ago. But the vast majority of it was, was woo. That, you know, the same thing that, that people, snake oil salesmen, would do back in, you know, the 1800s where they'd say, this will cure everything, you know, and they sell you a bottle of arsenic or something. Um, well, the guy that died, his name was Stanton Friedman. And he actually was one of the few people I'd ever looked into that field um, scientifically or close to scientifically. And I didn't really have a problem with that, but it's the people that make this stuff up. It drives me nuts. But I do not have a guilty pleasure in, as far as conspiracy theories, as far as I know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have one. I don't, I don't think, think I have, I have one. one either. I mean, um, and if you if you have to take a break too, because I you know what I realized is I I just took a break to go pee, walk around, <laughs> and my drinks pretty low, and I want to have uh, one more before we we wrap it up because I can I can do that. But yep. you, I'm gonna go get a, go another glass of wine. Yeah, and please do do that myself. I'll be back. Okay, and uh, oh yeah, so Chess, that's a great question because I do want to ask him also as well. Like his, his, we, we, we talked to him and I talked a lot and Brando was there for it. <laughs> Brando got to see this all live <laughs> with no cam. Um, and nobody else, you know, streaming it, but we talked a lot about AI. In fact, I talked about this with, um, <laughs> his mock AI, Aaron Knight. Um, and we were talking about AI and, and, and things like that. So she's, she's. She's amazing. So she always is the one that he talks to at the end of his 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 uh, videos, um, and she's just a brilliant mind. The person behind that that whole uh, play scene scenario. She's she's actually a wonderful person. Um, one of those people that I wish I had to talk to about things. And and John talks to her quite a bit because she's so thought provoking. It's just one of those people that you talk to and you're like, holy shit! Like, uh, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. Um, but we were talking about Enceladus. We were talking about Europa. In terms of microbial life, uh, those places could be very rich in our own solar system. And we were talking about uh, the cracks in Enceladus and the the topology that you can see. Not topo well, yeah, the topology. So that you can see with Europa, there's this like I think they recently just we we talked about this here on stream that that brown gold residue on Europa um, is that sulfur, uh, was it sulfur oxide? Um, when the flat people have this trip, well, what about Titan? So Titan's also really cool 
But we're also going to have that dragonfly mission that's going there where that, that's a helicopter that can land, right? Um, Titan, again, I'm so big about us exploring our own backyard. There's so much here in our solar system. The moons have a life of their own, I, and, and no pun intended. Um, but we already know that there's saline plumes with Europa and Enceladus. Uh, when we look at things like, and I'll bring it up in Space Engine, I'm, I'm going to teach John how to use this for his his stuff too. Which I already know Ross has been like, hey, hey, John, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> Titan's amazing. Titan has a very thick atmosphere. Um, but let me actually turn down the brightness here. Uh, but you can see... So tidal forces uh, on both Enceladus and Europa have, have stretched the, the regions on the surface of these planets. Um, so they expand and they contract. Uh, but again, we've seen the same kind of similarities, although they might have different stuff. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know... Uh, <clears throat> I hate using acronyms like that. <laughs> uh, since I'm in Austria, it's all more fundamental research. It is, it is. And like, so here's here's Europa, right? But here we go to Enceladus. And Enceladus has kind of a, a very weird, and John, I'll let you just talk for a second before I put on your cam. Here's Enceladus. It has those tiger stripes, which I don't know if I'm going to be able to show fully. But look at how great Space Engine, like, Look at how amazing this is. Look at that detail. Do you see that, John? Yeah, it's beautiful. Isn't it? I mean, we've 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 been able to raise on this channel uh, roughly about three thousand dollars for the devs of Space Engine when they were doing this for free. Oh, it's, fantastic! Yeah, and and I'm again being a computer science nerd. I think that this stuff's super important. But yeah, you get to see. So again, this is tidal forces, um, but but they're different. But they're they're very similar. We see the saline plumes from from both of them. Um, we believe that both of them. I mean, you can go on about this, and I'm gonna actually like just real quick grab more of this because because look, I'm hurting. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Enceladus is is an unusual object because it does not appear to be very old. It appears to be a relatively recently formed object. And when we look at it, we know that it has a subsurface ocean underneath that ice. But when you look at the cracks in the surface, they appear bluish, those, those striations that you see. They appear bluish in, in real-time color. And they... Uh, you know, they, they, we can analyze the plumes that come out of it and we see nutrients, you know, that there could be life here, but there may not have been enough time since this formation for life to have, have arose. So then you go to Europa and you look at Europa. Europa is an ancient object. It formed with Jupiter about four and a half billion years ago. And Europa's cracks are colored. They're brownish colored. Now, a scientist, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, a scientist years ago, analyzed that, those colors of that material and found that it matched certain bacteria here on Earth. So possibly the, um, the brown coloring of the cracks at Europa may, may be an indicator of life. Um, but it also, you know, you have IO dumping lots of sulfur compounds and, you know, there's organics, all kinds of stuff there on, uh, onto the surface of Europa. So maybe that's going down into the uh, water somehow and, and getting um, uh, extruded and it's just the chemical compounds and they're not, it's abiotic, it's not life. We don't know. Um, only going and checking it out with various missions is going to answer the question. What do I think of Eric Von Doniken? I think he was in it for the money. Um, he eventually turned his ideas into a theme park. Um, <laughs> which closed some years ago, but you could actually ride an ancient aliens uh, roller coaster or something. Um, but I, th I, I do not buy his conclusions at all. I think he was, he was, you know, writing, writing interesting books for people to think about, but wasn't actually, you know, real. Um, and the thing is this, the, the big problem with the ancient aliens thing is that, you know, we people look at the Egyptian pyramids and they say, well, humans couldn't have moved those blocks of stone. There are examples of the Romans moving way, way bigger rocks than that. They would actually transport columns 
and you actually see one in uh, the Baths of Diocletian in Rome um, that are monolithic. They're enormous, one single piece of, of granite that's way bigger than anything in the pyramids. And the Romans actually transported those from Egypt all the way across the Mediterranean to Rome. That is way, way above anything that the, um, the Egyptians ever did. The thing is, is the reason that we don't say that the aliens were helping the Romans is because the Romans told us how they did it. They left records and the Egyptians did not. And that's the, the difference. So for me, it's, it's like, why are y'all worried about the pyramids? There's, the Romans were moving much bigger rocks. So that's why I kind of find that whole thing, um, you know, <laughs> just sort of silly. Uh, will I do more talk with Avi Loeb on black holes? Absolutely. I would talk to Avi Loeb um, any day of the week, um, and he will certainly be back at some point. Um, and that goes for actually any of the guests on Event Horizon. I will talk to anybody again. Um, it's been a very uh, pleasant, um, fun time talking with those people, and I'm really – I enjoy my job way more than I should. You know, it's, I almost feel guilty for enjoying it so much. No, no, it's great because people like here. How many of you guys have heard of JMG? Just want to, I know there's a lot of people that are coming through that just watch Twitch, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big YouTube watcher myself, but who I do watch, um, I'm just curious if you guys know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you should check out Atlas, the Atlas of Moons on National Geographic page if you guys have missed it for some reason. What's Atlas of Moons? The Atlas of Moons? What's that about? Do you know? I don't know. I'm kind of out of the loop on that. I have no idea. I have. So, okay. So, you guys do know who he is. You put in the work. You deserve it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I can relate to that, though, too. So like, that's the thing when people ask what I do for my day job on here and I'm like, this is it. They're probably like a oh, motherfucker, <laughs> you know? Um, but I'm very, I'm very fortunate to talk about astronomy and, and things like that before the star party. Nope. But I like him now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad people got to discover him through the star party and he was a natural. He just answered questions and hung out. What do you think about the lost city of Atlantis, John? I think it's an accumulation of old anecdotal accounts mm -hmm. um, and part of a flood myth type thing, um, which may actually have a real basis. I mean, we know that the Black Sea formed within human history and, you know, the Bosporus broke open and the Mediterranean filled, you know, basically a pre-existent lake. And there are actually human settlements and stuff that are underwater that were destroyed by those. And that's maybe that actually, you know, caused the flood myths. Um, and I think Atlantis is one of those. Uh, but there's a bunch of, you know, there's tons of theories about what, what Atlantis actually was. What I don't think it was was um, any sort of, you know, magical unicorn place where, you know, but I think it's just uh, folk tales about some town or city that got destroyed in a cataclysm. Um, and there's actually, huh, there's actually an even worse one that seems to have a basis. Um, <laughs> He's laughing, which is Joe. Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, where God. The, you know, everything getting destroyed. And people there turning may, to salt if they look back. Yes, and there may be a basis for it because I mean, there's evidence mounting that uh, a meteorite similar to um, Chelyabinsk that just exploded over Russia a few years ago. There's accumulating evidence that this may have happened in the Middle East, but much lower towards the ground, like a Tunguska event, and just completely wiped out a bunch of towns, <laughs> cities. And that, that may be the basis for the cultural legends of things like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, what do you think about Bob Lazar? Because someone was asking that earlier. Because they always ask my opinion on that guy. He's making it all up. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. That's, I have a migraine. Uh, you know, we're going to have to get back to that question, yeah. John. I yeah, just have a migraine. Right that now. was bad showing up on Joe Rogan like <laughs> yeah. that. Um, but it's, uh, no, I don't believe him. <laughs> I mean, people being like, no, this guy's serious. He's like, you know, I just don't remember all the details. You know, I just got a headache real quick. It's just real rough. <laughs> it reminded me, it reminded me of Alex Jones when he claimed in court that he couldn't remember because he had a big bowl of chili earlier. <laughs> sorry, I got IBS and that chili hit real hard. 
<laughs> yeah, I had a big bowl of chili. I can't remember. <laughs> Like, we watched some of it, and people were like, why are you giving this guy a platform? First and foremost, he was on the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm not giving him a fucking platform with, what, my 200 viewers on average? Are you kidding? Like, it's it's these things, I think, honestly, having other people like JMG and myself watching and having a good time with it, that can... That, that takes away the power. Like the power is really going to be in the people that know about this stuff. Someone asked if you, if you went to school for this. Nope. Um, my, my, my back in 1994, me uh-huh. said, okay, do I want to become a scientist or do I want to become an entrepreneur? And my brain immediately said, I don't want student debt. Yeah. So I just didn't go. Um, I did take a few things and, you know, dropped out community college stuff, but nothing serious. And I, I've just basically freelanced. Um, I apprenticed as a, as a violin maker when I was um, 18. So I did that for a while. And then I worked at, uh, at a, uh, I worked in numismatics and eventually built a business on that, which is a study of old coins and economies, historical stuff. So I basically spent years as a kind of specialized historian. And then I decided I want to write science fiction in 2012, which is something that I always wanted to try, and I did. So, so yeah, I basically so you, freelanced it the whole way. <laughs> yeah, so, like, I mean, but what, I guess, like, I always wonder where someone's like, I'm going to write science fiction. Like, d- what was your, I mean, what what made you think that this would be good? Because, again, like, I I I have other passions that I might be good at, but I don't know what would actually make it worthwhile for someone to either listen to me or um it's a tough question it really is it it's it's something that okay think of it like this um when you go through your childhood and you want to be a scientist and then you decide that this isn't realistic right then for me writing science fiction filled a hole so so that so I'm, i'm essentially doing what Others did, like Arthur Clarke, Arthur C. Clarke did, where, you know, he had a degree, a degree mm-hmm. in science, and but he did wasn't really a researcher. He, he went straight in and became a sci-fi author. So, right. And I think those sci-fi authors serve a purpose. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, by in, in injecting ideas. And sometimes these, these ideas become something scientific. And an example of that would be the Alcubierre warp drive, where Miguel Alcubierre was watching Star Trek, wondering... I wonder if we could somehow make that warp drive work. So he came up with his, his uh, warp field idea just to ask a question, it basically a thought experiment within science to say, you know, could you do this? Could this be consistent with general relativity? Um, so it, it's a back and forth between science and science fiction um, that I think is important because, you know, scientists have to be very careful what they say. They can't, you know, say crazy stuff that they can't back up. You know, they, they're very oriented towards uh, the scientific method and all that. Well, the sci-fi author isn't, isn't governed by those. So I can, you know, say all kinds of you batshit crazy things and still be within my field of writing science, science fiction, um, speculative science and things like that. <laughs> and uh, that uh, that's that's the difference. But um, but fundamentally, yeah, that's 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 why I started writing sci fi is because I wanted to do something science related and use the accumulated knowledge that I had of, of science. And yeah. ultimately, that started the YouTube channel, too, you know. Yeah. So I, I always say that that the so I've heard different things and it might be Fraser's fault. So we'll just blame him. But so the Al Kubier mm-hmm. drive. So everybody asks me about that. And I'm like, guys. No. No. Um, well, but I'm just Dr. saying no. Dr. Alcubierre will tell you, you know, he'll be the first to tell you this probably is not going to work. You know? Right. <laughs> but, but, but so many people ask me about it. What did you just call me? <laughs> Joe. All the names. All the names. That's a bad name. <laughs> no, not really. But, but do you want to tell people? Because I get so many questions about it. And, and I'm like, I would, I would. Yeah, people probably think that I'm I, I'm not interested in technology. I'm not interested in any futurist ideas, which I totally am in favor of. I just don't want. Uh, did someone just say something about us? Oh wait, hey Greyhound, I got you. 
Um, tell, can you tell them a little bit just like what you know about the Alcubierre Drive? Well, the problem with the Alcubierre Drive is, is that it's, it's warping space-time in a very unnatural way. And the idea is that, you know, we have a speed limit in the universe, the speed of light. Can't exceed it. Except that that, only, that that does not actually apply to space itself. So a chunk of space can exceed the speed of light. It, indefinitely so, actually. So what the Alcubierre drive does is it breaks off through creating a certain geometry of space-time. It creates a piece of space that can move and move very rapidly, faster than light. So if you situate your spacecraft in that bubble, that warp bubble, faster than light travel in principle becomes possible. The problem is in actually doing it because to pull this off, you need, number one, a massive amount of energy. Now, we're not talking, it used to be you need a ton of energy, but people have recalculated. And they say you basically you needed the mass of Jupiter in energy to get this thing going. And the second thing you need is something, a material with negative mass. And materials with negative mass are not prohibited by physics, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they can exist. It's just not prohibited. Um, we have never seen this material. We have no idea how to make this material. And it's just up in the air. It's unobtainium, essentially. Oh, unobtainium. So, what an yep. original name. Yes. <laughs> and um, you can't, you just can't, um, you know, you just can't say that an idea is going to work when you haven't produced that kind of a material. Right. And that material is the same thing you would need to hold a wormhole open and create a stable wormhole. You also need negative mass. Um, now, in the far future, maybe we could create this material and, and do these things. But even still, the Akubi air drive is rough because you've got all kinds of radiation issues. And you would, it, it coming out of your, out of warp, um, next to a planet would Can be achieve faster it'd than be on level like a gamma ray burst i mean you would be just be and as a matter of fact that's actually one <laughs> one uh conceptual explanation for certain gamma ray bursts is that it's aliens coming out of warp um but in this case you would irradiate the planet that you're trying to visit so you would have to come out of warp you know way away from it and um you know you would essentially accumulate what amounts to a shock wave or a um yeah, sonic boom sort of analog, uh, only with radiation. So there's a lot of trouble with these ideas, and I just don't see them working. Um, and, of course, I don't really see any convincing evidence that aliens are warping here. So, you know, or warping by us or whatever, whatever they might be doing. So my, I'm guessing that it's probably forever not possible. But it's fun to think about. And, you know... Physics does give us a way to travel across the universe in a lifetime. Just go almost to the speed of light and you can do it. So if you really want to go to another galaxy, you can even, you know, slower the light. So you just can't ever go back in time to where you were. Unobtainium is the first innovative material patented by Oakley Sunglasses Company. Yes. Yeah, radioactive sonic booms. That's essentially what it is. It's, it's, um, what, great radioactive light booms, I guess you could say. Have you talked or will you talk about harvesting asteroids for rare? I mean, he can. He can. We've, we've got like, you know, I, I want to give him like 15 minutes here. I, I don't want to, you know, if you can go longer, I'm all for it, but I don't want to push you. I mean. I can go longer. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, I just, just, I uh, just, I mean, this is literally shooting the shit. Yeah. Yeah. I can go longer. Yeah. Um, let's see. Mining asteroids. Okay, there is actually a company the founders of Google are sort of playing around with to begin that process of asteroid mining by going there and, and mining platinum and bringing it back to Earth because platinum appears to be one of the materials that's worth bringing back to Earth. Um, now, that's about it. You know, there's not really much more with uh, the asteroids yet that is um, viable and you can make a profit off of other than platinum. But when you need to build stuff in space, they're great because you can get all of the building materials you need from the asteroids. So you just go get a near-Earth asteroid, disassemble it, and you can build yourself a space station. Um, so that's where really asteroid mining becomes useful is when you're actually in space and colonized out there. 
Um, so that's where it's real uses up except for platinum, apparently. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and maybe other stuff, you know, might be worth it, you know? Yeah. Platinum similar to iridium. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, very, yeah, very... iridium is very common in asteroids, but not common here. Right. Yeah. Well, look at, so I'm showing this in the background real quick so everybody can mm -hmm. see this. Um, wow. See, God, the production on this, I got it. I, man, Ross is great. Well, that right there is Erin Knight. Okay. Uh, she does all the, oops. Yeah, she does all the graphic design. Yeah. I mean. And many other things. She's a truly multi-talented person. I was just telling people uh, how how amazing it was just talking oh, to her. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's a genius. I like, couldn't do I, this. I, just, I, I could I, not do this without Ross or or uh, Aaron. It, right. It's just not possible. Yeah. And I, I want to sit in on those conversations. I got to admit, that was the one thing I really missed. Like, I was like, you know, I, I walked into these conversations where I, I, I just, I didn't know there was people out there that would just like talk to, about this just on the daily. Oh, you're welcome to come in and uh, and join us on Skype anytime you want because oh. we we all talk every day and and um, it might that, it might it be really is. this show this show emanates from a friendship between three people that just happen to be able to do things you know our parts exactly as they are this this show would not exist otherwise oh yeah it's a and that's yeah, the scene I mean look at guys look at we're just kind of sampling this um and now you can see Ross's Ross's beautiful images and editing that he does and just Joe Joe adding in you know get good take lessons from Ross Joe we're next level okay we're next level <laughs> and Fangresh just rated in you remember Fangresh he you met him he's oh yes yes uh, he just raided in with 424 people. Pay me. Oh. Hey, 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 you know what, Joe? I would pay you if I made enough. But you saw how much we had to struggle just for. Th um, hell yeah, brother. That's what Fingers just said. Hell yeah, brother. Hi, Fingers. <laughs> but seriously, when I, when, when Fang, before Fang came out to the desert, um, so obviously I had spent time with JMG here. I was like, oh man. Like, this is the person you're going to want to talk to. Because Fang always asks me questions about the future. Like, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? 3D printing. I want drones. I want drones everywhere. I, like, and it, it, it's not. It, I mean, they're, they're not. They're, they're really good questions where I'm like, you know, I don't know. And he, you know, because he, he loves sci-fi. And, and I was like, you've got to meet JMG. JMG. And hi, guys. Welcome in. Um, do you like to smell your own feet? Great. Um, John, do you like to smell your own feet? They no, might, they there might are certain be... things that are best not done. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I like, I like how you know. I'm just going to direct the weird questions towards you from weird people. Just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send it your way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, ready. I'm a radio signal, just your way. And um, <laughs> well said. I have poured another glass of wine. I now have. I've switched to Chianti. Oh, oh my God! Silence of the lambs. Yes, fava beans. <laughs> fava beans. There you go. Um, but yeah, no, I would love to be in those conversations because the thing is, is I do feel kind of sometimes like I, even though Fengrish is is wonderful to talk to about space, at the same time, and he's right behind me, which is not scary at all. See, see, John, this is my problem. Okay, so he comes up right behind me like that. And it's just scary. He can do mm. that at any point. At any point. Thank you for the host. And hell yeah. But um, yeah. Tea time will be chilling. Yeah, and and if you have questions that you want to ask JMG to maybe always. get, always, always. I won't bog it down now. You won't bog it down. You're gonna be. You're gonna be the whole chat. No, it's good. <laughs> I will not ask about feet either. But <laughs> He's not going to ask about feet. Good. <laughs> what do you think happens when we die? Oh, and not the Keanu answer. Keanu answered that. <laughs> uh, what happens when we die? Yeah. Either something or nothing. Um, easy, uh, either everything goes black or it doesn't. And that's how I sort of view it. Well, yeah. So uh, the, do you, but do you remember before you were born? No. Yeah, me neither. So usually, no. I assume I assume I would go back to that state, which wasn't that bad. Right. Thinking about it, um, no. So that that's my my gut feeling. Um, 
it'll either have you know something something will be there or something won't and either way it's you know um it's it is what it is um i don't spend a lot of time contemplating it because i do not i i I would describe myself as agnostic Uh in that i I have no idea no we don't know Um, yeah but i am not in any way religious um so it's just sort of and we just got another host uh so sorry no pressure but miss cookies just hosted Miss Cookies, you have to know who John Michael Godier is. You have to. If you love all the conspiracy stuff, even though it's sci-fi, he's not a conspiracy theorist. I don't want that to be mistaken. But he does talk a lot about the the way that extraterrestrial life would be, um, even microbial. Um, can And I think someone did already a shout-out. Hopefully somebody did a shout-out for Miss Cookies. She is a beautiful, wonderful person, guys. Um the other day, you guys did a sub train from here, and it was amazing. She didn't know what was going on, <laughs> and it was wonderful, and it made my heart happy. Look at her emotes. Do you see her emotes, John? Hmm. Aren't they cute? Yeah. They're great. Um, but yeah, Miss Cookies, you have to know who John Michael Godier is. Um, oh, nice. Been watching some of his YouTube stuff. Yeah, he's a YouTuber. I'm going to take away both of our faces real quick. And, uh, John, I will let you have a break real quick here again. So thank you. Please, you. please take one, my friend. Um, this is I'm going to show off some of his stuff here. Uh, well, I'm going to actually go back to this because let's wait. Let's go here. And OK, so that's how stars are formed. That's not even fair. Uh, <laughs> but this is him right here. So uh, and thank you so much, Miss Cookies. Thank you so much. I hope your day has been lovely. Um, sending you all the love. And you have to paint me something about space for my new house. Okay? So no pressure, though. No pressure. <laughs> Aww. You guys, have to, you guys have to follow her. She is uh, a, a very similar... She's a very similar person, so... Um, intellectual... Uh, and, and beautiful, I'm not beautiful as much as she is, but physically, but she's, but she's, she's, she's an intellectual. So I encourage people to check out her channel. Uh, I've been a YouTube sub of his for a long time. Love his illustrations, love his voice, YouTube gold. I know. So his, so he has a, he has a wonderful team of people. So, uh, Saucy Rossi is in here. Um, he's one of the, Aaron usually pops in. Aaron might be sleeping right now. Which is really weird because Aaron probably doesn't sleep much. Um, we are indeed quite similar. I so Miss Cookies, I'm copying some stuff from your background. I'm trying to, but I'm trying to make it my own too for my new my new setup. You've been an inspiration there. I want people to have kind of that star, like you know, low light background. And there's Saucy Rossi. So Saucy Rossi is Ross. Um, so we had the Fermi Paradox debate, and Miss Cookies, you would love this. Um, I moderated it, but I also uh, have this on my own YouTube with the live video. But this this is a lot cooler. It has, you know, space illustrations and stuff. Um, I'll do great. It would be so much better if I just had, like, one piece of artwork about space. It will be so relevant. <laughs> but, yeah, Miss Cookies made that. <laughs> Count it. Go buy her artwork. <laughs> um, Sky, the worst moderator ever? I'm not. I did a good job. This this thing was tough to moderate because there was similar, you know, stuff with it. And but John, John might have won out the gate. Um, that was that was the thing that might have happened. Um. And so, <laughs> uh, you literally did way better than I expected. Oh my God, Hazo, you're not supposed to say that. That's honesty that shouldn't be said. You're supposed to be like, yeah, I thought you'd nail it. You know, you, you hit it out of the park. You did a good job. You know, you're like, you did way better than I thought you would. Fuck. <laughs> No, I know a lot about the topic, but again, it's just so, um, uh, you know,
<laughs> I'm serious, John. <laughs> I'm serious. Look at these eyes. I'm serious. Um, it was amazing content, but I kind of felt like it turned into a discussion. Well, it is kind of a discussion. So that's the thing. With the Fermi paradox, it's really tough to find someone that's like, no, can't happen. Uh, and, and Fraser isn't... Um, you know, Fraser's Fraser. Well, okay. So John also destroyed it, right? John came in with a very, and I'm going to have him talk about it right when we get back into this. It's, it's so theoretical. It's not even theoretical. We're talking hypothetical, right? There's a difference between hypothesis, hypothesis, theory and law, and then scientific facts. These are all different things, but yeah, but he, he, <laughs> John, John being John, was like, uh, Fraser, I know how to destroy your argument right out the gate. And Fraser's like, okay. And he did. And then Fraser's like, damn. All right. All right. So, John, just let me know when you're ready. Um, true to high. Yeah, to find antagonists that are really passionate about that, it, it's tough. The Fermi paradox is a tough one because, again, we experience time right? So, so things when we only exist as a species, right? It's just humans for 200,000 years. Um, and I got you, Roger that, John. Um, and we can see things so far back in time as well, right? So Andromeda is a great reference for this 2.5 million light years away. So we're seeing it as it was 2.5 million years ago. So we're, we're this like sliver of time to be able to see anything, um, dick and balls, you like them? I mean, yeah. But Joe, thank you for banning. But yet, yeah, you know, I'm not going to lie. Dick and balls are not a problem. You got me. <laughs> got them. Yikes. You know, I, I, ugh, this is rough. I almost had to admit to something. I, I don't, I mean, yes. That is a yes. All right, John, you ready? We're going to bring you right back in. Here is John. I, I almost got put off course there. I just it was so, really close. You, know? <laughs> you didn't get to see it, but Fraser had a comeback. Did he? Yes. When 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 Paul got back at the banquet, Fraser was recounting my argument, and Paul's like, "Wait a minute, there's two kinds of infinity." So. <sighs> There was a wrench thrown in mine, and I still haven't researched exactly what he was talking about yet. So, ask ask Doctor Paul. About I don't know. If, oh, no, no, argument. you're gonna have to fill me in. I don't know. Doctor Paul has been super busy and super popular since he wrote a book. So, yes. tell me. Well, apparently, not all infinities are equal. Um, and I again, I haven't researched this, so I can't. I just it's on my list though because I was like, well, you know, wait a minute, that's right. <laughs> um, so it, he it. it I guess it's how you view infinity, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but my original argument was that we don't know how big the universe is outside of our observable universe, our observable bubble. And one option is that, you know, it may be just a little bit larger. Or another option is that it's infinite. And if it's infinite, infinity brings in possibilities like um, alien life and other Earths, you know, identical Earths, that if you travel far enough, you're going to find another Earth that's just slightly different from this one with the same people on it, you know, just something different, you know. Um, I'm not drinking Chianti. I'm drinking, um, <laughs> I don't know, what would I be drinking? Uh, Jägermeister. I'm doing Jägermeister shots. Gross. No, um, no never that. <laughs> and Yeah. Yeah. Um, downing a bottle of absinthe. Um, <laughs> there you go. So that that's possible so infinite infinite brings in infinite options as long as they're possible so as long as alien life remains possible of which earth proves that we are actually proof of alien life because we exist and that means that they could too then eventually they're out there somewhere now in so far as the the actual debate that we had, though, it wasn't really much of a debate because right. Fraser and I fundamentally agree that intelligent life, there's a lot of hurdles yeah. and it probably doesn't happen. He thinks it may not exist in the observable universe. I think it probably does 
somewhere at some time, um, but we're never going to be able to interact with it. I'm, I hate to be pessimistic on that because I would love a Star Trek world where I'm talking to aliens and interacting with them, but it just doesn't seem to me to be very likely. So what I do instead is um, I, I try to communicate with animals, you know, let's go talk to a dolphin or yeah. a whale or a cat. I've got two cats around here that I communicate with fairly well actually. yeah what if they had thumbs oh uh, end of humanity it's done but it's I, over that's that is too horrible to con contemplate i yeah. would give sauron the ring before i would give a cat a thumb oh wow that's uh, saying something oh yeah we're gonna oh, get yeah. into some tolkien notice lore. i just tied in i tied into your lord of the rings thing there oh, because yeah because yeah, we're gonna do more of that like i think we got like 11 minutes into a video <laughs> yeah i um uh, i am a lord of the rings freak Tolkien was one of my favorite authors. I had so. no idea. Mm. But I had, I, had yeah, this, to, I messaged you. The Silmarillion you. is sitting across the room. Yeah, no, me. but look at, look, I have this whole thing right here. Look at all these, look at all these. I go deep. Okay, let me, I'll be right back. <laughs> He's going to show me up, guys. I'm going to take off his cam so you guys don't see his booty because you guys aren't paying for his booty, okay? All right, you hear me? You ain't put, you know, no, no one's paying for his booty. Human civilization is still very primitive. Um, just an introduction to alien life that is technologically advanced. Uh, so embarrassing, just stage our development. Uh, or do you think it's embarrassing, or do you think they're just like next? Or do you think they're just because that's what I think? Booty will pay. No, you're gonna love this. I'm ready. I have to make room here. I'm so ready. And put my earbud back in. He has no idea. We're so ready. <laughs> You're so ready. We are. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I can do things like this. Uh-oh. Okay. So, okay. All right. All right. You got the ring. <laughs> and I can put it on top of a large model of Helm's Deep. Oh, my God. Everybody from Fengrish's stream is probably, well, they probably have left. They're probably like drops, but still, that's oh, amazing. God. Hold on, wait, wait, no. Can I see this in full? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. I want to. You guys have to be, wait. You have to show that again. So, like, keep it steady there. Hold on. Okay. <coughs> Anybody that that appreciates anything, that's amazing. Because we're gonna do more more of this. Uh, if he puts it on, does he disappear? We'll find out in like 15 minutes. <laughs> the Battle of Helm's Deep was the absolute best. I pulled a switcheroo. Look, it's Theoden's. We can't see yet. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Oh, oh. Wait, wait. You pulled a switcheroo. Wait, you have to hold the cam steady, though. That's... <gasps> wait, okay. Go down a little bit with your cam. The Tree of Gondor, right? That's actually Theoden's uh, hall in Rohan. In Rohan, okay. Yep. Oh my god. You're amazing. See? With my wine. Hey. And... Hey. That's how, yes. that's how this works. Look at, see, people are nerds in here and I love it. I love you guys being this way. Thank you. Nick and Chaos Psycho. Thank you guys. Um,. And there's like a bunch of other Lord of the Rings stuff around here. It's crazy. Yeah, and that um, goes hand in hand. I, I hate to say it as much as people are like, well, she just talks about space. I will lure your face off. And and JMG was here to attest to that. So this Friday we're gonna pick up on on all of that. So just in case you guys I'm 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 a nerd through and through. Um, but I'm I'm bringing up this uh and I'm gonna post this in here, guys, if you guys want to read this. Wait, wait, John, I'm pretty sure that this still says that I'm a famous YouTuber. Yeah, he didn't fix it. Oh, <laughs> he, yeah. <laughs> I told like, him, I told him, I did what I was supposed to do. The famed science communicator, computer scientist, and sometimes musician who has routinely had Fraser on her YouTube show. I'm Pull on YouTube show. I have a YouTube show, John. Hey, nice, nice. You know what? I'll show you up with my, I'll show you up. You ready? Well, well, no, wait, I can't. It's this inappropriate. Silly. Well, no, I was going to show you up I with my you. mouse pad. My mouse pad's like all space. Here. 
Here, I'll do like a there there you can see that, but it's it's all the way over here. Oh wow. Yeah, that's a that's what you gotta invest in. <laughs> but sorry, everybody's like great, free show. You're welcome. That's not gonna be clipped by like five people. But it's okay. Um yeah, I got a huge space mouse pad. You guys don't even know. That stream deck. <laughs> nice companion when it works. Why clipped? Because I showed I have legs, and I'm a streamer that doesn't have legs. Because if I have to get up and walk away, this is what happens. Right, John? You already know. Yes, I already know. Yeah, he I already knows. I my camera. It's, it's being difficult on me. Oh, you're fine. I can also help you with that, too. You're good. So, guys, do you have any... Wait, some. so wait, someone was asking... Oh, wait, you have to tilt it down more. I know. I, I'm, I'm almost... There we go. There, there we are. Hi. Should be good. <laughs> so, so uh, people were asking about your opinions on AI. Uh, Tilt it up a little opinions. bit more. Sorry, you're gonna hate me. You there you what? go. I'm Perfect. Gonna... <laughs> we'll do it like that. No. <laughs> you're now just the voice. That's fine though. Honestly, I'm totally fine with that. That's actually kind of cool. All right. <laughs> Fit the narrative. You're good. Well, uh, <laughs> I am the voice of God. <laughs> AI scares the bejesus out of me if we take it too far, but just as it is right now, I'm not particularly scared of it and I find it useful, but, um, there's going to come a time where it gets really scary, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm laughing. Cause this is literally, like, this is an amazing cam shot. You should have, you should have done this the whole time. That's how every old person takes selfies? No, they're not even that good. That's, they're not even that good. You like get like half the, half the beard if this, this were an old person. He's, he's actually not that much older than me. Um, <laughs> hi, Chef. Uh, hey. <laughs> so no, do, does anybody have, because he's, he's got about 10 minutes. Good goatee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm more worried if we be wait if we develop a real neural network or even freakier quantum AI. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's just it. I mean, what is the effect of? I mean, <laughs> I don't like any. I don't like an AI that I can't predict. And the big problem with AI is, you know, what's it going to do? You know, when it shows up. Um, I mean, it it might become an immortal dictator and um, you know rule humanity forever. Or it may launch itself into space and say, see ya. Mm -hmm. And we never hear from it again. Or we see, you know, it, it just commits suicide. You know, we try to turn on these our, our artificial intelligence that, you know, human for all intents and purposes. And it just shuts itself off and commits suicide, you know, thinking the universe just isn't worth it. I so. mean, that kind of happened with Chernobyl. But it wasn't AI. It was just, you know, robotics, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, they actually drove themselves off off the cliff, right? Well, the roof. Um, which that's that's one of those things. So, have you have you watched the HBO series of Chernobyl? No, but it's on my list because everybody, including Ross, is saying, "Hey, you gotta watch." Um, oh, so it's it's on my list. I just haven't gotten to it. Yeah, Ross, you gotta try harder. What do you do? You need me to to like call? Well, if you know, I want you guys to call me tomorrow. Um, but I'm serious about that. I do want to have one of those conversations. I want to be inspired. Please, mm. I do. I do. I just want to. Yeah. Unleash Aaron on you. Yeah, I can put my Skype back up. I fucking hate Skype, but. Um. So do we. But if you do interviews, it's easy. You well, know, I mean, it's the look easiest at, way. I mean, change camera it? angles again here. Make him watch it. Watch what? Oh, he, he will. He will. So we, now we did a whole thing with with Chernobyl. Um, uh, Why wow, that was an easy fix, John? What the fuck? I don't know. All of a sudden, it worked. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Murphy's Law, right? I <laughs> Uh, mumble is better for audio. Well, no, I don't want audio. Like, it, it, you guys get a rare treat of actually being able to see John here. So, again, 
And I'll play through something um, after he's gone. We'll watch one of, do you have anything that you would really like me to play to showcase what you do? Personally. Um, I, I recommend yesterday's interview with, uh, with uh, about HD 139, 139 with okay. um, yeah, Dr. That. Andrew Vanderberg. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I've already started to watch it, <laughs> and then I was like, I need to stop. You can see that right yeah, here. That was actually one of the, one of the, one of the better ones. I would also recommend Alcubierre. That one, you know, is a, he doesn't talk to very often, you know, he doesn't do many interviews, so that was a good one, too. Yeah, people are going to make me watch that one. Watch. They're going to be like, don't, yeah, go watch that one. Yeah, that one, that one's good, and that, that is the origin of the, the, joke or meme or whatever you want to call it about uh schrodinger's possum i think uh -huh. oh no that was actually another one that was i don't know that, that was the one where the cat's in the circle right there oh man i was in the hospital that was with dr minev talking about um you know quantum theory oh yeah yeah um so i'm gonna let him wrap up here guys uh yeah, I'm sorry about that. That that must have been really rough to be in the hospital with Chernobyl children. Um, have you had Isaac Arthur on? I have not, but um, again, so like these are people that I, I, I'm like, so you guys will see much more of JMG in, in this format where we're really having a good time. Um, he can feel like he can get away. Uh, but answer questions still about space. That's, that's the kindness you guys kind of afford me sometimes, sometimes you guys don't, um, <clears throat> but having that freedom to just kind of hang out and have a good time, uh, and, and, and be involved in this stuff and science. And, um, so if you guys have any final questions for him, we'll have him back. Don't even worry about that. But, uh, I just uh, don't want you guys to feel like this is like a last thing. So, um, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so I, I can't read any more depressing stuff. Was there something, MG, that I shouldn't read? Cool guest told me. <laughs> no, no. They, uh, well, nothing depressing. Okay. Um, well, wait, wait, wait. Want, what, what are your well, ideas hey, you want, on what lies beyond the observable? I well, my idea of what lies beyond the observable universe is more universe as we know it. So I think as you go past that observable universe point, you'll just see more galaxies, more stars, more nebulas, all the same stuff. If it's infinite, then it never stops, and you just keep running into you know more nebulas and galaxies, and then eventually you get tired of seeing galaxies, and you've seen so many at that point billions and billions that you're just sick of galaxies and you can't handle it anymore. And then you run into another earth and another you, or you run into an alien civilization and then you go and go through countless more galaxies and space time and you get sick of it again. And then you run into a slightly different earth from the one you just left and so on. That's if it's infinite, if it's not infinite, then I think what you would do is you would, uh, just see more stars and galaxies until you reached, you know, the end of the universe. But the idea there is that you just come full circle and end up where you started. So that's sort of the <laughs> the end result of it. Right. Which isn't Either depressing way, it's pretty at all. weird. <laughs> right. No, I am not having an existential. Car well, you know what? I I am that. That's a good job description for me. Yeah. Professional right. existential crisis. That's what we do. I have it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week yes. for my entire answer, my and, entire life. Yep. And, and the thing is, is I have to hide that from you guys live where he can edit that shit out and doesn't, you don't have to see his face. And I'm sitting here like, guys, this shit is real. And then they're like, man, she looks panicked. You know, let's just troll her. And I'm like, no, it's rough out here. You guys don't know. <laughs> You know, you know, it gets bad when you when you stop looking at the universe with telescopes and you just go outside to shake your fist at the universe. That's when you know that you've become a true nihilist. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually love pondering the stuff because oh, yeah. it leads it leads to wonder, you know, wonder leads to science fiction novels, ultimately. And great discussions. And great discussions. And I, I just don't. Um, 
it it all still amazes me decades later, you know, and decades of amateur astronomy and everything else. I still can go outside, look up, see Jupiter and say, wow. And that's what keeps me going. Absolutely. Which you guys can see, go out, look south around 10 o'clock at night. And that big bright thing that you think might be a star, nah, uh that's Jupiter. <laughs> that would be Jupiter. And if you have a telescope, you can see four of its moons pretty easily, the Galilean moon. Yeah. Pair of binoculars will do. Yeah. I always tell people if they squint really hard, they'll see it, but probably not. <laughs> you need you need really good eyesight for that. But I did in a very dark sky location actually spot the Andromeda galaxy one time when I was younger. So I can't do that now because I can't see anything. Um, I know. I'm the same. But, um, but when I was younger, I did actually naked eye spot Andromeda, which I thought was, you know, pretty amazing. Uh, the moment you stop asking why you've become a robot. True. Yeah, but there's there's so much. There's so much um, in the sky. Anything that you're seeing is delayed, and I think that that's really cool. I think that that's what gets me excited about this stuff. When you look at stars, I mean, what we can see stars that are, I mean, I think the max. And I think we're, we're wondering what Deneb's actual distance is. I've heard anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000 light years. But, you know... You know, too, is is if you ever when you look at astronomy, it's it's sort of a thing that that you're separate from. There's you and your world and then there's the universe. So I sometimes like to go into like oceanography and mm -hmm. just live in ocean oceanography for a while, because that just shows you what's possible in the universe. You know, yeah. I mean, think about that. These just swarms of jellyfish and things like that. And you realize you know, maybe this happens somewhere else, but looks a little bit different. What could it look like? Bioluminescence and all of these things that happen on Earth give us clues what could be out there. And I, uh, I find that if I ever get tired of astronomy, that's where I go. I just go in the ocean. Yeah. So, so someone brings up a good point. And Clever, I love your face. I'm so glad you're a part of my stream, and I'm so glad to see your face over and over again every single day. But you said that space makes me depressed. Uh, that I don't, or that I won't ever know what's out there. So what do you think about that? Because I know, I, I understand that. That's like space a real does, thing. Space does not depress me. Um, space is, is my escapism. Because what depresses me is everyday life, you know, of course. Yeah. Although not that much. But, I mean, well, for example, I lost my mom um, in February. So that's sort of something that looms large in life right now. Right. <clears throat> so for me, the space is the escapism. And I try to make that escapism for everyone else with my channels to for people to just say, I'm going to put work, politics, all of that stuff aside. And I'm just going to focus on the universe and what this guy's saying. And that's the ethic of, of both of my channels really is is to give people a place where they can just put that stuff down, you know, the yeah. humdrum everyday life and and go into the sublime, which is the universe, or for that matter, dinosaurs, or, you know, history <laughs> even. Yeah. Um, or anything that just, just... Or Tolkien. <clears throat> or Tolkien. Yeah, absolutely. Or my novels. My novels are designed for the same thing. Right. So it's all this sort of providing escapism. Right. And, you know, and there's lots of ways to do this. Games are a, a great way. Um, <clears throat> I can actually tell you that... It would probably be pretty easy to guess my all-time favorite video game. Metroid. As far as, yes. Did I get it? Close. Close. Uh, Mass Effect. Oh. Well, no, it's not yeah. close. <laughs> well, Mass Effect's sort of like Metroid, I guess. I mean, kind of, but different. I mean, we're talking... Okay. <laughs> like I so so when I when you're like, yeah, Metroid, like I have my NES over here. Like my original. Mm -hmm. Do you see this? Yeah. Like, I do. Like, I mean <laughs> copy. And so when I hear you say Mass Effect, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> well Mass Effect would be more like PlayStation Three, I guess, but uh, Yeah, Mass Effect. I do Effect's actually have though. my I do actually have my original uh, Commodore 64, still oh from God. 1982, 83, when I started messing with computers. That's beautiful. Yeah, Mass Effect was amazing. That 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 Mass Effect had some of the best hard sci-fi in a game I've ever seen. 
and now it's getting old, but it, it I still love it. And I still pop it into the, you know, I still have a PlayStation 3 run and I still pop it in there every so often and just do a playthrough of all three of the original um, games just because it was so great. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't like Yeah, that. Andromeda, that was, we shall not mention. Right, but, yeah, I didn't like it at all. Yeah. Yeah. But the first three you know, original ones were amazing. They were. They were. They were. I will agree with you on that. Um, but, you know, I will let you you go for the evening and have a wonderful evening, and I will talk to you again soon. Yes, I'm going to go and cook a pizza. Please do, and then, and then call pizza. me tomorrow. Will you just, just text me and be like, hey, we're getting on Skype, and then I'll download it again for my, my phone. Yep, absolutely. We'll get, we'll, get, uh, we'll get a hold of you, and then we'll all sit in there and talk. Um, yeah, it might be more it. towards evening because Aaron is in the U.K., um, Damn it, Aaron but, just needs to learn how to not sleep, like insomnia. Yeah. You know, I've I've taught Joe. Joe, well, Joe already knew. I didn't teach Joe shit. Joe already knew. He's in the UK. Joe's in Manchester. No, not Aaron like Manchester. that. E R Y N. Joe, okay, female. All right. <laughs> Joe, I'm offended. We're all offended. I'm kidding. Shit. <laughs> Yeah, canceled. That's right, Joe. This is not live. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he's he doesn't sleep. So um, then two thirty three a.m. here. Well, we're gonna watch this. I do want to see this. I promise you guys this. So um, yes, in between uh, cooking the pizza and all that, I'll be in the chat for a while too. Yeah, he'll hang out and answer questions yep. as best as he Anybody's can. Anybody's got any questions? Yep. Yeah. So thank you well, so much. I stuff my face with 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 cheesy goodness pizza. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I hate you, but I love you, but I hate you. So I will talk to you soon, my friend, and yep. we will we will convene soon. Yep. See ya. All right. Bye.